Welcome again to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Scott Shaw. Scott has received four Emmy Award certificates for story direction on Jim Henson's Muppet Babies, an Eisner Award for his work on Bart Simpson's Treehouse of Horrors, number five, for Best Humor Publication, an Eisner Award for his work on Simpsons Comics 1999 for Best Publication for Young Readers, the San Diego Comic-Con's Ink Pot Award for Outstanding Achievements in Comic Books and Animation, the Humanitas Award for Camp Candy, the Shazam Award for Best Comic Book Humor Art, and a Squiddy, Art, uh, and a Squiddy Award for Superman and Batman World's Funnest. He was nominated for the Eisner Award for a set of Oddball Comics Trading Cards, Best Comics Related Product, the Rubin Award for Television Animation Division, and the Annie Award for Outstanding Art Direction. Scott is a member of the National Cartoonist Society, the Comic Art Professional Society, and the Animators Guild. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you very much. I, I'd forgotten I'd done all that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got goosebumps thinking, wow. How yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a good way to kind of frame what we're about to dive into. So uh, go ahead and Jim, start off the early chapter. I know you were born in 1951, and it was in Queens, New York, which is fairly typical for people we interview, but you didn't stay there. You moved, as a, as a young person, you moved to the West Coast. Um, uh, talk about um, your upbringing a little bit. Okay, well, uh, both my parents were uh, grew up in uh, central Illinois, in a town called Decatur, Illinois, uh, which uh, referred to itself as the soybean capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And my dad joined the Navy when he was a kid, uh, shipped out for boot camp in San Diego. That's why we wound up in San Diego. My dad always said that that was the nicest place he'd ever been, even nicer than Hawaii, where he was shipped out to and happened to uh, be there during the time of the uh, attack by the Japanese. His ship was uh, capsized by an explosion. He survived. They made him an officer almost immediately because they had lost a lot of people and they needed uh, smart guys, more smart guys ever than run things. My dad was a smart guy. He wasn't uh, an educated man. He, like I said, he grew up on a farm. But uh, so the reason we were, I always say all that because that's why we wound up in uh, New York. My uh, dad was the uh, aide to an admiral and uh, even before I was born, my parents were living in the servants' uh, quarters in the mansion that mm. this general had been placed in for a while on Long Island. And uh, so anyway, I was born in the Navy hospital. And about, uh, I guess my dad was restationed in San Diego. But knowing my dad, we figured out a way to get that all manipulated mm -hmm. in the system all through the war. And I think he just kind of understood how to play things, how to talk to the right people, how to trade favors and stuff. Because he did that the whole time I was a, old enough to notice that he was like the honest Sergeant Bilko. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. My, my, my dad just knew how to get these little favors done. So we wound up going out to San Diego and I was two and a half years old. And uh, I grew up a white kid in a Navy town with a father who was a Navy officer, life was pretty good for me. Mm -hmm. And in San Diego with uh, Balboa Park and, and all these museums and all this, you know, animals, prehistoric stuff, all that. I mean, I was going to the Museum of Natural History for classes when I was five years old. And the first night, the first day we were there, we were sitting in the front row, and they put a, uh, a 15-foot boa constrictor across the laps of everyone sitting in the front row. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so, so were you an early reader? I was an early reader. Excuse me. I was, I was reading by kindergarten because, like every kid my age, we had subscriptions to Walt Disney's comics and stories. Yeah. And it's funny. I asked my mom not too long before she died. I said... Uh, he said, I was born in 51. By 53, Americans were being told that comic books caused their children to be uh, juvenile delinquents. 
that point on, there were comic book burnings. I'm sure you saw them on TV. Why were you buying me all these comic books? Were you trying to breed yourself, Doc Savage style, a, a, a young uh, a criminal? And, they, and my mom just rolled her eyes and said, well, all I know is you sure seem to need them. Because mm. I was already trying, I taught myself how to read and draw with comic books. I'll never forget, I had a Woody Woodpecker comic. And in those days, it was pretty much all Funny Animal and uh, Dennis the Menace and Dennis the Menace imitator type books. And I'll never forget, it was a story where Woody Woodpecker had like a little drive-by short order stand out in the middle of the desert and buzz buzzards driving by trying to con him and he orders a piece of pie and i remember sitting there thinking that pie is just two triangles and they're drawn i didn't know the word parallel but it was like oh and then if i connect the lines here it was like i never had had a how to draw book in my life mm. And I'm already, and I remember that was the first thing I ever taught myself how to draw. Was a not pretty good for a fat kid. It was a, it's a pie, <laughs> but you know, it, it was that sort of information. And then after a while, by the time I was, oh, in third grade, I think I skipped the fourth grade. I was, I was in an interesting program in California. I was in the first wave of it. It was called the Gate Program, gifted and educated. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You were protecting us from communism, right? Yeah, they wanted us all to become scientists. Therefore, I never got any art classes, even though in the very name of the program was gifted and talented. Mm -hmm. However, I've always rejected the term talent because I think that's just what the money guys, the term they used to think were like idiots. Oh, <laughs> oh wow, that's interesting. Oh, they're just talented. It's no more effort for them than going to the bathroom. You know, I mean, that's a much easier way to, not pay us much money. Oh, wow. But uh, anyway, where was I on the other thing? Um, well, we're, 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 we're going to talk about the comics you were reading because you're mentioning oh, mostly wow. funny animal books. Um, <laughs> was, were there other things you were reading um, too in terms of comics or was it primarily uh, Dell and Disney and, and so forth? Up to a certain point. I'll never forget. I was uh, five years old. My dad, I was in the hospital for uh, my tonsils. And I've talked to a number of people online about this guy's my age. And it seems like a lot of kids who were sent to the hospital, they're on their own, they're promised ice cream, that's not nearly enough. We liked comics already, but suddenly comics became our best friends because we didn't know any of these other kids. We, you know, and if you're a nerd, you were kind of hesitant to even introduce yourself to other kids. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, my dad brings me what I imagined in my mind to be a towering stack of comics. It was the most comics I'd ever gotten at one time. It was probably maybe 10 comics. But um, still, I'll never forget, I got a, uh, I got a uh, Mighty Mouse book. I got a Dennis the Menace book. I got um, Woody Woodpecker. I mean, you know, the st standard kitty comics. But then in the middle of that was an issue of Superboy. And it was Superboy on the cover. He's the one-man baseball team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I really didn't give a damn about sports then, and I even care less about it now. But seeing that cover with the same guy on it in fit nine different places or ten different places, whatever, whatever it was, that really got my attention. Yeah. Interesting. I picked up that comic at a show in San Diego not that long ago. And as I read it, it was really eerie because I realized I, that was one of the comics I taught myself how to read because the vocabulary was bigger. And I could, as I'm reading it, I'm already remembering what the cap, what the dialogue is in the next panel. So that book must have really had an impact on me. Uh, maybe not to be a superhero artist, but certainly in terms of just, you know, being able to, to read something that, I mean, I don't think, Mark Weisinger had a lot of tricks in terms of drawing the kids in, you know, every mm -hmm. panel state the same thing in three different ways. Right. But you know what? It worked. I mean, he may have been the, the meanest editor in the history of comics, but I think he was a brilliant editor. 
Mm -hmm. outside of ripping off his creators, <laughs> giving one the guy would come in and pitch one story to him. He'd say, that's that stinks. And the next yeah. day, hey, I've got a great idea for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Plot it to the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of his understanding what kids would be willing to do to, to understand these things and how to help them out in terms of having the visuals and the words in sync at all times, that's the whole point of comics, right? The words support mm -hmm. the pictures and the pictures support the words. Right. Sure. It made it much easier to teach yourself. I mean, I can't imagine. The last comic I superhero comic I would give to a little kid would be Spidey Super Stories only because they at least kept the dialogue down to a minimum and the storytelling would have clarity. Yeah. But after the point where fans, you know, started reading Jim Steranko and thought they were as good as being artsy fartsy as he was, and I don't mean that as a slam on Jim, I just think holds up great. But from that point on, a lot of people are saying, let's be tricky before we understand how to tell a story. And it's just gotten worse from that point on. I see. So in, in retrospect, looking back at the books you were, you were looking at, are there artists that, that, that you think influenced your own, your own work and artists that you really admire that you didn't even realize who they were at the time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I do kid stuff now, not always, but that's probably where most of the money comes from. And the guys that I, I loved back then were Sheldon Mayer. Not, not, I wasn't even reading Sugar and Spike then. I was reading Three Mouseketeers. Sure. Mm -hmm. Lived in the tomato can. And um, I loved the uh, Dennis the Menace, especially the big giants, because those were done by, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Fred Toole and Al Weissman. And I prefer those actually to Hank Fisher's version. The, the, I think those guys, or at least I mean uh, Weissman and Kurt Schaffenberger, may be the two finest draftsmen in the history of comics. I mean, mm. they don't draw anything. Mm. And I mean, I'm sure they weren't getting top rates for any of that stuff, but they just knocked themselves out on it. And I understand Hank Ketchum was a real hard guy to work for too. So mm. I think they. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. Yeah, I hear, I hear it all through the business. But anyway, those were a big deal for me. Carl Barks, of course. I wound up becoming friends with Carl years later, and that was a big deal. Um, let me see. Oh, Little Archie. I really like Little Archie. And Bob Bowling, I think, is a really overlooked writer. I mean, his art is great. But he could write kid stuff, kind of like John Stanley, with a eerie understanding of how kids think mm. but bob stuff had this kind of kind of almost uh sorrowful gravitas to it at times that i just think still is brilliant it, it's my favorite archie stuff i that it spoke to me um i was i was born in 59 and i was i was reading that stuff uh, I didn't discover the Stanley stuff until later, just when it's been reprinted in the last right. uh, five or six bit, yeah. years. But the uh, bo the bowling stuff I was reading as a kid and just loved it. I used to get beaten up for reading Little Lulu. Boys don't read Little Lulu. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I got very beat celebrated. Up a lot too. It's very celebrated now. <laughs> oh well, well, none of that stuff happens anymore. Now the the nerd gets laid. Are you kidding? Yeah, it's a good time. Not that I would know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It is such a different world than it was when when you and I were, were going through school where I, I was the only one. You know, there was nobody else uh, for most of my, my school. There was uh, when I would be on a, a, a bus as the baseball manager, I would pull out my comics and, and people would read them. But um, you know, but that was me. That was the I was the only one that that actually knew what they were. Me yeah. and uh, Squirrel O'Brien. I used to get beaten up for knowing how to pronounce dinosaur names too, because oh, the, yeah, even though the kids were all watching giant dinosaur-like monsters. Oh yeah. Actually, it's it's unfortunately it's way too much like it is now. Knowing stuff can get you beaten up. It's really it's really yeah. now, right. Yeah. 
people hate science and are acting like, you know, we're just sorcerers and stuff. I mean, I was very, very, very interested in paleontology as a kid. And not that that's a science that's going to save mankind, but I was, I was talking to one of my doctors the other day. At the end of the 1959 movie, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, yeah, which has the only lizards as dinosaurs that really look like dinosaurs in them because they understood how to shoot them. But at the end, James Mason gives a speech to the other boy scientists at a college or university. And he gives this very intelligent, I mean, even now you go, he says, we went to the center of the earth, but because we can't prove it, it's up to you to prove that this exists. And I thought, I bought in, I bought into that my entire life. I mean, just because I didn't go with paleontology, a, a, a teacher once told me, he said, uh, says, you're not going to go to the Gobi Desert and you're not going to be running a museum. You're probably going to wind up working for an oil company, finding them petroleum deposits. Right. And almost immediately I said, well, that's my hobby now. <laughs> Cartooning, <laughs> they were kind of both even. Okay. But you know, dinosaurs and monsters, I mean, I would think that an awful lot of cartoonists my age, that's kind of where it all started. Yeah, you know, we uh, a few weeks ago we interviewed uh, uh, Bill Stout. Now you've known him for forever, haven't you? We met in 1969. Yeah, I and you did. both have that same uh, West Coast presence too. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, you guys are West Coast based professionally, and and also you've done so, you both done undergrounds uh, comics and things. Yeah, Interesting. and diverse careers. Yeah, and Bill and I both can draw like Big Daddy Roth, so I mean, <laughs> I think that Big Daddy Roth thing really was a big deal to guys our age. It was like, it was like, here, get as get as wild as you want to be. People like that. So you're a Ray Harryhausen fan, then? Oh yeah, yeah. I watched uh, Seventh Floyd to Sinbad last night. Oh, that's awesome. So it's fresh in your mind, yeah. Tingle, and I never seen it on at home on such a big screen. So I mean. The only sad thing was you, the monsters in close-ups, they're shiny. You can really tell they're plastic. You know? Yeah, that's right. It's, so, it, so did you go to Ackerman's house when, um, when he was still uh, having people come over? Many times. That's where I met Don Glute. That's right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I was friends with those. I'm still friends with, with uh, Don Glute. I was friends with Bill up to his death. I mean, uh, Again, Greg Bear, Dave Clark, uh, John Pound, the guy that did all the uh, Garbage Pail Kids, we all went to high school together, and we'd go up to Forney's house. We'd usually get one of our moms to bring us. Oh, wow. And the first time we went to Forney's house, this is really unusual. We go to the house. He's not at the front door, so we go down the, hall, down the uh, long driveway, to the back of his house, we thought, okay, we'll knock back here. Maybe he's in the other part of the house. The back door has been broken into. The window's been caved in. There's glass everywhere. And then we realize, we go back out, and we see there's press books laying in the gutters. And we realize, holy crap, Forey has been robbed. And about that time, Forey drives up. And he never even... He never even once acts like he thinks we did anything, you know. Yeah. I mean, we were concerned. We weren't trying to run. So he was, he was I guess, for he's been revealed as being kind of a creepy guy if you're a good-looking woman. But we only saw, you know, I mean, he, he had no reason not to be nice to us, I think. Yeah. But he understood that we weren't responsible. However, we hung around. He said, "Don't you don't have to go away. And the insurance guy shows up. Now, I think I was probably all of 14 or 15 at the time. And Forey, who was a big fan of this artif kind of artificial language, starts, without any setup at all, starts speaking Esperanto. Oh. As an insurance adjuster. Out <laughs> of the weirdest place he's ever been in his life. I mean, huh. You know, this makes the tiki room at Disneyland look like nothing. And on top of that, Forey is starting to speak a language that he really has no idea what this is all about. And I'm, as a kid, I'm thinking, 
before he's blowing it. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like if he wants his stuff back, he better he better pretend he's normal. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I don't know how he got through it. I think he finally just reverted to English when he finally realized this guy wasn't, you know, understanding a thing he was saying. <laughs> also kind of proved that maybe Esperanto didn't work as well as it was intended because supposedly if you knew more than two, if you knew at least two languages, you could kind of get the gist of things. Hmm. But um, <laughs> this guy was not, uh, not ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, yeah. You know, I, that makes me think of the, the last time um, I met you, which was at Comic Fest, and, and I'm going to go somewhere with this, but I was there with my son. Alex was there. We, we did a couple of uh, panels. Um, you were there, and um, you had stepped away from the table, and I was talking to your son, and, and I was introducing my son, Willoughby, who was seven years old, and he said, my dad will love to meet him. Just wait. And you came back, and I introduced you. And instead of just saying hi, Willoughby, and signing something, you had him come around behind the desk with you and sit there with you. And you gave him like a a ten minute art lesson and step by step how to draw Sonic. And it was one of my favorite things that's ever happened at a, a any com- convention. And I've had I've been to many, many. And I when I saw that. I'm thinking now of you talking about going to Ackerman's house. And I know that Jack Kirby, when you're a little bit older, that he was very welcoming and it's a paying back thing. And that's really important to you, isn't it? Yeah, it really is because um, I had, I had mentors in San Diego before I ever met Jack Kirby. Um, when I was in high school, one of my friends on the school newspaper staff, cause I drew yeah. comics for the school paper. Excuse me. Um, she set me up with her uncle, her uncle, who was a local cartoonist named Bernie Lansky. Mm-hmm. None of you have ever heard of him, but he uh, he he uh, he was kind of a George Lichty uh, style cartoonist, mm. which the, which at that time kind of drove me crazy because I like cartooning where the shapes were really obvious. So stuff like Lichty and and uh, uh, you know. Dennis the Menace and things like that. I like I like things like like Beetle Bailey. I like right. to I like stuff where I could teach myself how to draw with it. That for example, uh, um, oh not Ralph Steadman, but uh, Ronald Searle used to just drive me crazy. How do you spell his last name? Searle S E A R L E S E A R L E. Okay. Yeah, Michael Dooley is a big fan of him, Alex. He uh, writes a lot about him. Of both uh, Gerald Scarf and uh, Ralph Steadman with that kind of, you know, what looks a mid, uh, certainly at first just like a nest of lines, and then you go, wait a second, this is somebody that's just, just drawing organically. And I remember uh, Searle's stuff just, just disturbed me like crazy, and then I got to a certain point where I went, oh, this guy's brilliant. A lot of a lot of the artists I couldn't stand when I was a kid. I now really value. Yeah, yeah, and I find I'm doing that too. I like more as I get older. Yeah, but anyway, back to the back to the San Diego mentors. Not only I I would meet with Bernie every Thursday at the Jewish Community Center, which was on my way home, and uh, we'd sit in a little side room, and he'd say, "Okay, show me what you drew this week," and then he'd critique the hands or the gags or whatever, and in a very kind way, but kind of do it. And then another guy, Gene Hazelton, who <laughs> not coincidentally was drawing the Flintstones and Yogi Bear strips at the time, mm-hmm. who, was, who was considered to be such a great cartoonist that when he was at MGM, he wasn't, he was the only guy that wasn't assigned to anybody's unit. He was, everybody wanted him, so they let him float around all the different projects so he could, you know, come up with at least a few sketches for him. But he was, um, he lived in uh, an area of San Diego that had, uh, he lived right on the edge of a golf course. He was <laughs> just like a lot of older cartoonists, older than me. Um, he loved to golf. So he literally had to walk out his back door and he was on the course. Hmm. And I'd go over there and he was doing, uh, he'd draw everything on tissues first because that way it made him easier to trace and that way. And I still do the same thing. I rough something out and then I do that so I can kind of 
tweak things without getting the paper itself all, you know. Yeah. Get a layout going too. And he'd give me the tissues at the end of the day. And I still got them somewhere in a box because, I mean, I just, you know, stared them like they were the, you know. So, so when did you, when did comics become something that you thought... I'm I'm interested in this is maybe something I, I want to do. Was it you you came in through through comic fandom and the conventions and things, but when you were doing that, were you oh, did you think you wanted to draw comics for a living? I, I knew I wanted to do that since I was five years old. Oh, but that's it, great. Or be a paleontologist. Mm. Or a kitty cat. No, that was when I was little. <laughs> um but uh no, I, I, you know, I think most cartoonists I know seem to somehow understand that from the time they're a kid. I don't think their parents understand it. Certainly their teachers don't understand it. It absolutely infuriates me because I'll go to schools for um, career day and they'll want to have me back and I'll say, well, next time I'm happy to talk to all the kids, but what I really want to do is talk to the kids who want to be cartoonists. And they'll go, well, how do we know who those are? And I'll say, well, they're the oh. kids that get in trouble for drawing in class. Mm. And I'll say, well, why, do we, why should we reward them? <laughs> I almost start screaming when I hear that answer because I think you are the shittiest teachers of all if you don't get that. Yeah. But teachers, bad teachers seem to think they're being insulted because they're not being listened to. What it is, is they don't get that some kids, if they got a piece of paper in front of them, they just have to put something down on it. And it's, it's, it, I mean, when I was in college, I got a, a scholarship. And so I thought, well, I've got to perform. And the first couple of weeks, I was taking notes like a real human. And by the third week, I've got cartoons in the margins. By the fifth week, the notes are in the margins. Mm. By the eighth week, I'm not going to classes because I'm staying home and drawing the stuff from the school paper. Yeah, so it's like almost like ADD turned into turned into creativity. No, there is absolutely no money in it, so I don't think anyone is ever going to do a scientific study. But I think it's in our DNA. Yeah, uh, my dad wanted to be a cartoonist, not a cartoonist. He wanted to be a uh, sign painter. Side painter told me that but i've kind of put that together he taught me how to use speedball pens when i'm about six years old oh cool right there you know he liked lettering he loved lettering he loved showing me how to letter stuff for like those science projects where you'd have to have a little display in your classroom or in the auditorium someplace he said you gotta make this stuff legible and when he was away you know he wasn't away that much like i said he knew how to kind of manage his where he was stationed when he was in the navy and after he stopped being in the Navy, he went to the San Diego Zoo, and they don't move that, so he had a permanent job there. Mm -hmm. But uh, he, um, he liked to uh, do paint by numbers when he was away. And I, at the time, it's like, well, that's my dad. Then he also liked to make these very ornate Christmas decorations for the roof of our house. So look, and then, and then some of his buddies came out for his funeral and said, ah, oh, we heard you're a, you're an artist. You know, your old man wanted to be an artist too. But my dad never said anything directly to me about it. Mm -hmm. I had heroes at a very early age, and I don't think he wanted to try to compete with Dr. Seuss and Big Daddy Roth and Jack Kirby and all the guys I was right. raving. It's funny though how it works when when I'm when I'm in court. I, I probably a thousand times I've been sitting there while the judge is, is talking and people are objecting and I'm drawing pictures of the, the judge or I'm drawing uh, just cartoon people and my, my client who's facing whether he's going to have custody of his son or not turns and says, Hey, that's pretty good. While, <laughs> while the thing's going on. <laughs> you better watch out. If the judge notices what you're doing, he may have the, the clerk come over and say, I want to see what it is that has you interested, <laughs> young man. Yeah. He's going to get, he's gonna get a ruler and ear. slap your hand yeah. with it. <laughs> Caricature of himself, and then you're suddenly a uh, park. <laughs> so now, um, now let, before we go into your comic, uh, uh, the beginning of your comics, let, let's kind of, I, I just want to go through like a quick, 
um, professional chronology because in the 70s um, you were doing you know underground comics various co as well as helping uh, co-create the San Diego Comic Con um, with people like uh, Shel Dorf, Ken Kruger. Um, then in 78 there was some involvement in Hanna-Barbera Comics which appeared to be a gateway into actually working in animation in the 80s. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I watched as a kid, um, you have your fingerprints all over, like the Muppet Babies, um, you know, Popeye and Son and things like that. Um, a lot of the Saturday morning cart uh, cartoons used to ha have commercials, like serial commercials. And then in the 90s, you're basically doing uh, uh, commercials like the Flintstone cereal type things that I remember I was eating that cereal because of those commercials. Um, and uh, then, and that went, the the, anim the advertising goes to the 2000s, and then you start doing actually stuff with Disney um, in the 2000s, and then the Oddball Comics as a historian, that's more the recent stuff over the past, what, 10 years or so. Um, no, I, so I've been doing Oddball Comics for over 40 years. Actually, it's been going on even before the comic book resources stuff that you were doing then. Long before that, yeah. Oh, okay, that's awesome. Um, not, to, not to correct yourself, but the interesting thing is, all these things kind of melded into each other. Yes, that's right. Um, my dad once told me, and it's been the best advice I ever had, he said, learn to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, the comic... I was always working for the school papers, so that gave me the idea of how my work looked in print. By the time I was doing stuff for underground comics, I was also doing advertising and promotional work for a lot of local businesses in San Oh, okay. Not that many, not enough to support myself. I still had a job, but my job was at the um, San Diego City Schools um, Instructional Media Center, which is where they kept all the textbooks and books that were checked out to the kids all over town. So we were expected to file books or unpack books or whatever. I got that done in about an hour. Everybody else were retired Navy chiefs who were like stretching it out all day, you know, shooting the bull with their buddies. I get it done. And then I go back and reread every book, children's book in the library. Cause I thought sooner or later, I'm going to be doing children's material. Nice. I children's books all over again from an adult point of view. Wow. And I moved to LA and I got a job. Again, I'm not getting enough job cartooning to support myself. I went up to LA one point and went to ad agencies and studios and everybody was nice to me and said, you're just not ready. So I thought, okay. So a year later I thought, okay, if I'm up there, I've got a better shot. I had friends that owned a comic book store about a mile away from Hanna-Barbera. I thought, well, that's the place to meet people from Hanna-Barbera. I never wanted to work for Disney. I always wanted to work for Hanna-Barbera or Jay Ward. I actually had a job offer to work at Jay Ward when I was in 11th grade. Um, but my parents said, well, we're not going to move to L.A. for you to take on a free job. But they were doing George of the Jungle at the time, which I would have killed to have worked on. Oh, wow. <laughs> how, did, how did they come to you? I mean, like, how did well, they come? Well, because I, I was doing... Um, I never got any art classes. They wouldn't let me have them because of the gate program, but they would let me do teacher's assistance because I, my counselor made it clear the only way she thought that I ever would have a job is as a teacher, not as a cartoonist. She said, you could do that in your spare time. And I was old enough to say, look, I know teachers don't have spare time. Don't feed me that crap. I didn't say it that way, but I made it really clear. No, that's, that's an, I, I will be a teacher only as a last resort because I had other plans. Either I figured if I couldn't make it as a cartoonist, I wrote well so I'd be a journalist because I like I like working on the newspapers too. Yeah. Anyway, um, where was I going with this? Remind me. Well, the, uh, the Hanna Barbera stuff, George of the Jungle. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I was working for this teacher, and she was the ex-wife of a guy that worked at Jay Ward. Years later, he was one of the directors on Yellow Submarine, which I didn't know. But I wish I could, because that's my favorite feature film. Feature. Oh, cool. Yeah. But anyway, um, so she sent me his, my, sent him his, my sketchbooks. He was directing at Jay Ward. And uh, 
they came back and they said, if, if, if you can come in here, we'll, we'd like you to be a, be a, uh, an intern. And, uh, this was when they were also starting to do a lot of the Catholic French commercials. And that was something I always had my eye on too, because I realized, well, Hanna-Barbera and Jay Ward are good studios, but I like the animation and commercials better than anything because they're different all the time. Yeah. Um, anyway, I wound up working for my, uh, High, junior high paper, and then my high school paper. I won a lot of awards for the high school stuff. But then one day I went in and picked up the art for a, a, a strip that had won like some state award. And they said, well, uh, we just gave it away. Somebody came in and asked for the original, so we just gave it to them. So I, I kind of hit seven on the anger scale. And then I went over to pick up some comics I'd loaned to one of my art teachers. I finally was getting a few art classes. And all those comics seemed to have disappeared. The ones that were his favorite artists, Rick Griffin, mm. you know, Rick Griffin all the Rick Griffin books. Yeah. In fact, the style they were missing. And I just said, screw it. I'm not, I'm not learning anything here. I, I'm better off. I'm getting, I wasn't getting enough jobs to support myself, but I was getting enough to kind of reassure me that I, I may have not known what I was doing, but I was kind of bullshitting enough people that they thought I knew what I was doing. Yeah, sometimes that's all that's all you need. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, I dropped out of college in my senior year. And uh, it wasn't a full scholarship, so my parents were paying for the last couple of years, and I felt kind of still feel bad about that, but too late. Um, but I moved back to... Uh, San Diego. I was going to Cal State Fullerton by this time. Oh, my wife teaches there. She's a professor in film and television there. Did you like it? I mean, oh. besides dropping out of it? No, I absolutely loathed Orange County. Are you kidding? I was, <laughs> I was getting stopped by the cops all the time. And frankly, you know, growing up in San Diego, I mean, San Diego, you can go from the mountains to the water. Orange County, the only way you know where you are is what your the, the nearest mall is called. Everything looks the same down there, at least it did back then. And because it was so dull, all the local kids, their goal was just to get as loaded as possible on anything they could find on the weekends. It was really a grim place to be. Huh, like crazy glue or something, huh? Yeah, I mean, I believe me, I was getting stoned a lot of the time, but I mean, it was I was kind of like the most... <laughs> the restrained guy there. I was like, I, it was just a bad scene. I didn't. I got you. But uh, it may be different now. I hear now it's uh, not even run by Republicans, so that's kind of interesting. It used to be the most. Concerned. It changed uh, just recently. I don't know if it'll stick or not, but I think Bakersfield now has that uh, reputation. That's so where you, moved, so you moved back to San Diego. Yeah, I moved back to San Diego and uh, worked uh, at that instructional media center where I could uh, bone up on all these books. And then I moved up to the comic book store and uh, I had enough people from comic books. That's where I became friends with Roy Thomas. That's where I became friends with Steve Gerber. Oh. Uh, that's where I, uh, a lot of guys from Hanna-Barbera that wound up becoming my friends would get in there. And, of course, uh, I already knew Mark Evanier. I met him at Jack Kirby's house in 1970. By that time, Mark was working for a Western Publishing, and the uh, former editor of Western, a guy named Chase Craig, who was an outstanding, nice, you know, uh, supportive editor to bring in a young kid like me, Mark suggested me, and he hired me as an inker. Hmm. So that's when I started working on those Marvel Hanna Barbera comics. Okay, and that's uh, now. Now we're talking like 1978 or so. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. let's go back in time because I want to go back to your very first underground stuff and how that got um, picked up. Uh, that was uh, Gory Stories Quarterly. Is that your first um, um, comic professional work? Yeah, that's the first time anyone paid me for my artwork in a comic book, and that was published by Ken Kruger. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I see. And that book was uh, John Pound, my friend from high school, who has gone on to become, he was doing comics and he was doing painted book covers and illustrations, magazine covers. 
then he was doing all those garbage pail kids. Things. I love those. I, I have, I have every single one of those still. I love garbage pail kids. I just did a video. I just art directed a video game of garbage pail kids. Oh yeah. That's cool. We animate the actual cards. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So they don't look crummy like the TV show. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, I was the only one on that team that remembered the show. And I said, no, we're not, we're not animating them traditionally. But uh, anyway, John uh, and I were both in Gory Stories, which was our first comic. And frankly, I'd been, uh, I'd been being a hippie a lot more than John was because he was sitting at home and teaching himself how to draw. And uh, the difference in our, in our abilities is rather marked in that comic. But, you know, it's still okay. And uh, the main thing was it got us both out there. Mm -hmm. and Ken was actually somebody who was also integral to Comic-Con because um, when I was going to Cal Western on that scholarship, uh, the, low, the, the nearest area of San Diego with any real stores and it was Pacific Beach was the hippie town in San Diego still is. Mm -hmm. And main drag there, here I go in, it's a science fiction bookstore and Ken runs it. What I didn't know is in the back, it was a porno store, and that's how he paid the bills to sell science fiction. In fact, oh, wow. in fact uh, Ken has to told me he had 14 different bookstores over the years. And quite honestly, uh, as one of the founders, Ken knew how to sign contracts, how to, how to make, you know, what to point out, what to say you got to change. And, quite, and, and this, isn't, this is kind of admiration having been an underground cartoonist, therefore a bit of an outlaw myself, Ken knew how to stay ahead of the cops. And yet at Comic-Con, I think it was the first one at, it may have been the first one at the El Cortez, but it may have even been earlier than that. Somebody stole somebody's comic and they were like, what to do? And Ken yelled, call the cops. And they got the police there and they arrested this guy for stealing a rare comic book. Wow. I'd probably cost 40 bucks, but still, you yeah. know, <laughs> nobody, nobody else there even understood that, Hey, this is a real crime. This isn't just high school mischief. You know? So you, you, um, helped, uh, you know, kind of form that first San Diego comic-con with, um, Dorf and Kruger before you, uh, you published or were, were paid to do comic work. Like you were actually more like, I mean, although you were artistic and doing artistic things, you're actually kind of a, a fan that then two years after that, then you did your first comics work that was paid for. Sure. Because, uh, you know, I was doing stuff in fanzines and fanzines. Stuff, you know, fandom. I, from the stuff I sent you, I don't know if you can tell, but we all, be, or not all, but the guy, there were two kind of two groups of so the collectors and dealers. The other guy you haven't mentioned that was essential to the comic con. And we now, I was talking about Richard and, uh, and uh, Ken Kruger to people for years, and finally everybody agreed they were as much co-founders as the other guy who named himself the co-founder, or the founder. And uh, anyway, Richard was a comic book dealer. He was about a year younger than me, and he had money. He was very successful. He advertised in Marvel, and I don't think DC was taking any kind of ads yet. And he loaned the con, I believe, $2,500 to start that first one day show. Oh, okay. That's important. Yeah, he put up the money, and then he was the, he was the uh, first chairman, too. And uh, a very sweet, smart guy. And all, What's all his name? Was, Richard what? Richard Alf. And he also had the first comic book store in San Diego called Comic Kingdom. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was really a terrific shop. But, uh, you know. And, and, and all those shops were kind of like hash, <laughs> hash, hash bins or something, too. Everybody would go in the back room and get stoned. I, I can't believe they were never raided. Nice. So, so after you did um, uh, Gory Stories, um, where, what, what were the next things? When, when did you start doing uh, work for some of the other publishers? Uh, Kitchen no. Sink and so no. forth. Almost immediately, then I got some gig from a little, almost a fanzine, but they were trying to kind of cloak it as an underground comic. And I don't can't even find a copy, but it was ARC was the title. I don't even know what it's, remember what it stood for. And I did a thing called Jones of the Jungle, which was kind of a George of the Jungle thing, except it was an executive trying to, trying to run the jungle like a business, like a corporation. Um, 
then uh, I started getting uh, other little underground things. I think Savage Tales. I did some for my friends uh, Simon and Siegel. I think that was rip off or get no last gasp and 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 i mean it just kind of started spreading out from there mm -hmm. and were you doing the the same kind of things that as some of the others or was your work standing out because of your your interest in your your roots and uh and uh animal stuff and and the stuff that you like from the early on in comics well my underground comics were pretty pretty mild i didn't do a lot of uh sex stuff in them if i don't think i ever did any sex stuff in them there or in my life um i also uh you know i i, I just didn't want to get too political it was more just just goofy stuff mm -hmm. so, uh, i really don't the thing i come <laughs> the thing i've done that was the most offensive was i did a poster for jack kirby about uh the monster with a giant schlong <laughs> <laughs> that was rather embarrassing. Um, I didn't send you a photo of that. And was was he uncomfortable with that, or was he was he okay? Well, he was okay in the long in the long run, but at the time he was pretty against because one of my friends I didn't tell Jack this, but I didn't just bring him the artwork. I brought him a printed poster, and it was a takeoff on an issue of Strange Tales cover. It was now Deranged Tales. No monster who says no human can beat me and of course i changed it right like one of those like monster books that kirby kind of did you hear a monster. Like, what are those names like goomba and uh things like that <laughs> i'm sure it was goomba but <laughs> charlton it was goomba yeah uh, <laughs> yeah charlton sure uh, but but jack looked at this thing and he goes uh he was just he was just kind of like at a loss for words and i said here jack this is for you and even down the corner it was printed in honor of jack kirby yeah. you know because i had heard jack had told me when i first met him i told him i was doing underground comics and he said i like underground comics oh yeah and i thought i meant he liked to read them no he meant he liked the fact that people owned their own stuff yeah fifty dollars a page and owning it was not a bad page rate in 1970 and there was no house style. Everybody could draw the way they wanted and do the story. Do their own thing, yeah. Jack meant. I thought he just liked sitting down with a good issue of Zap Comics, you know. So I completely misread him because he was so cooler than my dad. I figured, well, maybe he's, maybe he's this cool, you know. Yeah, the monster schlong. Maybe it'll work. Yeah. Well, you... you you named your son Kirby, so I, I assume Kirby was incredibly important to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Was it was it his his work or was it your relationship that, that, that prompted that? It was definitely my relationship, but I wouldn't have really cared that much about him if it was it wasn't the work. I mean, I think I first saw Jack's stuff in that secret origins giant that reprinted a chapter from his first challenges the unknown and that pretty much fascinated me mm -hmm. then about the same time at the same place i bought that comic in fact i saw spore the thing that grew on the cover of tales of suspense 11 and mom that's what i want no you're gonna have nightmares here buy this nice issue of space mouse and <laughs> kirby and uh, and after that, it was when the I, I wasn't on board with the first year Marvels, but definitely by the second year, I was buying everything I can get my hands on. Yeah, and I couldn't get over how much I liked his work, inked by Chick Stone, because it looked cartoonier. It looked more like a like like the Fantastic Four cartoon show that Anna Barbera did. But he was a big deal to me, especially when that first issue of not brand Eck came out because i never realized that cart there were cartoonists could draw both adventure and funny stuff equally well and jack's sense of humor just killed me i didn't realize that he'd written more or less written the scripts on those two stan mm -hmm. added some stuff but a lot of that was jack's humor yeah. and jack had a really unique super funny and unique sense of humor to him and uh so when I met him, 
I told him, I said, Jack, you were always my favorite cartoonist, but now it's just an unbelievable. And I remember he, he really got a big grin on his face when I called him a cartoonist because everybody else was kind of kissing butt and saying, you're the greatest thing since, you know, Leonardo da Vinci or whatever. But Jack liked to refer to himself as a cartoonist, not because of the, the style, but because of re if you go back far enough, the real cartoonists are guys that wrote and drew their own stuff. Yeah, Milton Kniff and those guys. Yeah, so that's how Jack thought of himself because those guys were his heroes too. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. Number one hero when he was a kid, and Alex Raymond. But um, the, uh, you know, we kind of got each other, strangely enough. And I, and I had the balls to ask him if he could send me a drawing. And about two weeks later, he did. And he didn't know anything about me, really, other than I was a hippie who liked his work. He sent me a drawing of me in San Diego being strangled by King Kong. And King Kong's my favorite movie. And he's my favorite actor. So, uh, you know, from the end. And, but I'll never forget the one thing Jack told me. He said... And, and it's funny because my career is kind of dependent on me being able to imitate everybody else's styles. But he said, do it your way. He said, don't, don't try to imitate me. Don't try to imitate anybody. Try to do it the way you think it should look. Mm -hmm. And I do that to kids all the time. And I say, this isn't from me. This is from Jack Kirby. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So out, out of the, the mainstream comic people, would you say he's the one that had the most uh, impact you, uh, on you as a person? I'd say Jack and Neil Adams. And Neil, because he was the first cartoonist I met who wasn't nice to me. Oh. <laughs> and he was intentionally not nice to me. And that was a, that was a good thing. So I assume you hadn't met Gil Kane before that then. No, no, but Gil would come and hang out at my, t at my desk at Marvel Productions when he dropped stuff off. And I, first of all, I'm looking up at him, so I actually am looking into Gil Kane's nostrils, which was kind of... Uh, Ironic. Yes. But also, here he is, because we talked before it shows, and he knew I liked his stuff, and we got along fine. But he's sitting there doing his my boy thing, and I'm like struggling to get something done, and I'm thinking... I never thought I'd think this, but I wish Gil Kane would leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, where, where were we before that? I get off. Uh, Neil, you were talking about Neil Adams. Neil. Well, it was at the, um, it was at the convention. Let me see. Third year, I believe. And uh, I was, by that time I was kind of not, not a star cartoonist, but within San Diego fandom, I was kind of like John Powell and I were the two guys that were kind of everybody had their eye on as possibly being candidates to be professionals. So I have my portfolio and Neil is there and we're not in the Beulah's room. We were in a room I remember the carpet. So I bent down and just spread my portfolio open on the floor because it was a real big. And there was a whole group of people gathered around us. Not the best way to be showing somebody your work, but it just happened that way. So I'm, f I'm flipping it. I said, is this okay? Yeah, yeah, he's looking down at it. And the only thing I knew that Neil had ever drawn was humorous were those um, Bob Hope and Jerry Lewis comics. Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted his advice. I mean, every cartoonist has advice, right? And... I show him everything and I get back up and I say, so Mr. Adams, what do you think? You think I have a chance? And he says, well, and he kind of pretends to ponder and he looks at me right in the eye and says, the best thing I can advise is that you give it up. Wow. And you know that shot in Ghostbusters that they did with Sigourney Weaver sitting in a chair and it was on a track, so it looked like everything's pulling away from her? Sure. Exactly how I felt. That was the feeling, yeah. Well, was this 1974 or something? 75? 73, I think. 73. And so anyway... Um, Neil gets this look in his face like, holy crap, this kid's having a heart attack. <laughs> and he suddenly goes, well, uh, I mean, may maybe you could talk to Joe Orlando. Uh, maybe you could talk, you know, what was the, um, uh, 
was his name? Harris? Saul Harris? Was he? Saul Harrison. Saul yeah, Harrison. Harrison. He says, maybe you could talk to Saul Harrison. And I was like, I don't want to talk to anybody else right now. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm going to go hide my head. Because all the cartoonists I met by that time were, were nice guys. I didn't realize I, Neil was a nice guy. And so anyway, I don't even remember exactly how it ended. I, I think I thanked him. I would <laughs> But I mean, I was just like, what was that? But about, I don't know, it was probably in, in the late 1980s. Neil um, took me and my wife and Frank Miller and uh, Lynn Varney out to dinner. And after we all order, he kind of stands up and he goes, well, see, it worked. Apparently, Neil said that to anybody he thought had potential. Wow. I wondered about that, if you were going to say that. But he seems to think that that, that, now this is funny because I love Neil, but Neil, like every cartoonist, has a very healthy ego. We have to. Here might, here's some lines on paper. Would you please give me some money? You know, I mean, <laughs> it takes a bit of nerve to even ask that. But Neil has worked in advertising much longer than I have, and he really yeah. knows how to, you know, sell something. But he really thought that somehow that him telling us that was what gave us the drive and the stamina and the backbone to face it and do it. Yeah. No, nothing would have nothing would have diverted me from my goal to do it, other Either than way. a lot of rejections from people that were hiring me or could yeah. have hired me. But um the funny thing about Neil is he can do really good cartoons. In fact, the earliest stuff he did, I think, was for Archie and uh, Atomic Mouse. In fact, yeah, I st- yeah, he um, yeah, the first I think his first panel was uh, the transformative fly um, that he did, uh, and it was like redoing a Kirby panel, and they liked his panel better or something. Um, and yeah, was, uh, but- some of those one-page joke things for Archie. Yeah, for it was for oh, yeah. Oh right, for, right. I, I remember those. Yeah. Um, so Scott, I um, I'm going to turn you over to Alex as soon as we do the Hanna Barbera stuff, and then I'll come back to comics after he talks about animation some. But uh, let's talk about you uh, uh, working for Marvel when they got the license to Yogi Bear and the Flintstones and uh, Laugh Olympics. I was buying all of those at the time that you were you were drawing those. Um, what uh because i bought everything marvel did it at that time what what uh how did you get that job and and what were you doing with it well that was because mark evanier suggested me to to chase craig and, and i was still uh doing underground comics pretty much and i was working at uh, the comic book store down the street from hanna barbera but um which what, store was that by the way it's called the american comic book company and uh, they did mail orders, so I did all the art cartoons for the catalogs and stuff. So, you know, as I said, that that the main reason I took that gig was because it was near Hanna Barbera, and I knew I wound up meeting people, and indeed it happened. But Mark was actually the guy that put my uh, name and phone number on uh, the editor's desk, and um, my first job was to ink something with tissues over a light board which I'd never done before and is really burns out your eyeballs trying to ink looking down with a light coming up through it. But that was kind of nerve wracking. But after that, I started inking a lot of stuff and then that editor decided to retire and Mark took over. So he started giving me penciling and writing stuff too. Oh, cool. We're also doing a ton of stuff for overseas, which is even better because then if I screwed up, at least nobody here had to see it, so I wasn't as embarrassed. But um, we weren't really working for Marvel. Marvel was buying these things, but it kind of was almost like uh, Western publishing packaging for Dell. Mark mm-hmm. would send out the whole thing pretty much put together. They wanted to edit it. I don't know if you remember, but somewhere I've got it. There's an ad for the Hanna-Barbera comics that I think Marie Severin drew without any model sheets Mm -hmm. and it shows why they had to get us the reason by the way that we that that Hanna-Barbera was and Marvel were involved was the previous uh, 
license holder was Charlton Comics. Sure. Yeah. They just, hey, you know, these are these are just simple little cartoon characters. Anybody could draw them, and frankly, ninety percent of them are just horrible. And the people overseas that were reprinting them noticed they were horrible too, and started complaining to Hanna Barbera. They said, "We're not going to print them unless you get somebody that draws these, because you know, overseas they appreciate good humor art a lot more than American yeah. comics." I've never understood why. I think it might have something to do with, with the people, comic fans being criticized that they're just like that baby stuff, you know, for reading comics. But why is Garfield like incredibly, not the greatest thing, but I've worked on him. He, with Mark Evanier writing him, he's easy to do. But uh, Garfield is so successful outside of comics. But if you had Jim, Jim uh, Davis show up at Comic Con, he'd probably be s sitting there with, waiting for people to notice him. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's strange. Now it's kind of evening out because fandom and public uh, acknowledgement of this stuff is, you know, kind of infusing each other. But for a long time, it just, I couldn't figure out why, why comedy and humor stuff was not embraced by comic fans. No. In fact, the first adult I found out that liked humor comics like me was Maggie and Don Thompson. Hmm. I used to get their... Uh, they used to send out a, a, a one-page fanzine called Beautiful Balloons. And some friends of mine subscribed to it and was like, holy crap, here's an, here's an adult older than me that likes Uncle Scrooge every bit as much as I do. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when the Marvel, um, okay, so when the Marvel Harvey, you know, or the, the Marvel Hanna-Barbera comics were, were being done, um, was, that, was Jim Shooter editor-in-chief then? Was that like set because that's seventy eight? So was that was it more like Archie Goodwin? Um, I'm not sure. We never. I I never had any contact. I don't no know. Real contact. I okay. Was answering to, but quite honestly, he didn't answer. You know, they wanted to. They wanted to do the uh, the uh, letters page. They wanted to do all this stuff. We just said Mark just said no. Okay. And so, apparently, they had a very specific. Uh, uh, contract because all the books ended at the same time. I, I don't know what they were selling, but based on the number of them that are out there that are just beat to hell, I imagine they sold pretty well. Right. But Marvel was doing that at the time too, to um, grab up stuff that nobody else had the license on. They did Dennis the Menace for a while. I, I don't remember that. Huh. They were playing with two before they actually created that incredibly uh, unsuccessful line of star comics mm -hmm. right um i have a question about in relation to this uh were you had you followed and were you a fan of some of the um the comic strip artists that were doing things like that i think of people like harvey eisenberg who i, I think was very good uh, I, did, I think harvey eisenberg is one of the finest guys that it's ever drawn comics i just wish he could have written his own stuff i would have loved to see what that was like i'm good friends with his his son and uh, who's also an outstanding cartoonist jerry and uh, jerry designed a lot of the early Hanna barbera characters oh cool but, uh, harvey eisenberg i think the earliest stuff of his i can find is from uh, timely stuff but uh he just even the Hanna-Barbera stuff, these flat designs that really didn't move around much, um, he gave them life and dimension. In fact, uh, the Hanna-Barbera uh, movie, Hey There, It's Yogi Bear, in their model sheets for the movie, they actually just asked, because he was working for the studio too, he actually uh, just loaned him some of his tissues. They cut him up and made just his rough drawings of Yogi Bear into the model sheets mm -hmm. because he drew, drew Yogi. I mean, I think he, Gene Hazelton and um, uh, what's his name? The guy that designed him. Um, Ed Benedict. I think they're the three best Flintstones guys. Hmm. And I got to tell you something. Now that me TV is showing them, chronologically I can only even handle watching the first two and a half seasons after a certain point they're horrible they're mm, really yeah. horrible. and yet even at the time I didn't really notice it as a kid but boy once you've had to produce and direct cartoons you notice 
So were people aware, like when you were drawing Yogi Bear, did people say, oh, that's like, they knew who Eisenberg was and they, they, they understood that the people you were uh, like at Marvel or the, anybody that you were talking to, or was he an unknown person? Mark, Mark Evanier was the only person who knew who Harvey Eisenberg was, or Pete Alvarado, or any of the guys that were drawing those comics. I mean, I collected the, the good Hanna-Barbera comics, really, until maybe 1970. Hmm. And the Flintstones, too. I, there, there's, I mean, there were good stuff coming out of uh, the comic strip stuff, more than the comics, up to a certain point. He was writing and drawing it for a long time, but a lot of times he would hire Harvey to uh, do the final uh, pencils. I don't know if he was inking them or not. Uh, he had a couple of inkers that he liked or the editor liked on him at uh, Western. Um, um, trying to think. In the comic books, Pete Alvarado was also doing them. Uh, a fellow named Phil Dallara was doing a lot of them who had worked for Warner Brothers. I mean, almost all the guys at uh, at Western had worked on these characters in one way or another in for the studios, except for Eisenberg, who walked away from animation pretty much except as an advisor occasionally. So were you thinking that this was going to be a stepping stone into a Marvel career where you were going to be drawing Spider-Man or something? Or, you know, I'm being facetious, but... But did you see it as a way to get into the, the big two um, through this? Or was this, you realized what this was, was a continuation of your cartoonish, funny animal kinds of things, only just on a more commercial level? Well, it's interesting because I didn't, I didn't really expect Marvel to hire me. But about the same time as I was doing those comics, I was still working in the, in the uh, managing the comic shop. In fact, the, the, it used to be a dentist's office, so it had a little bunch of little rooms in the back, and the back one was my studio. Oh, that's cool. Probably the only place, or at least the first place, I'm sure there have been many since, where the comic went from being a blank piece of paper to a back issue. But uh, I mentioned earlier that I, that's where I got to know Roy, know Roy Thomas. Um, Roy and I met at when he came out to Comic-Con, I think in 75. But uh, I don't. I, he admitted he didn't remember me. Every every kid wanted to meet Roy Thomas. Then he was the best writer. He and Denny O'Neill were the two top guys at the time. Yeah. At the same time we had Kirby Steranko and Neil Adams there at the same time, and they were all the most guys everybody was looking at. You know, on that in that way. For art, yeah. Roy came in a couple of times, and you know we hit it off. And he asked me if I wanted to do a backup in in. Uh, what if, and I pitched him, what if a radioactive spider was bitten by a human or bitten by a radioactive human? And he liked it. And I did it up. I had a panel with uh, Peter Parker that I got my neighbor, Dave Stevens, to draw. Uh, when I moved to L.A. from San Diego, I brought Dave up with me, kind of. He, he was probably three or four years younger than me, so he'd never rent an apartment. I, well, here, get an apartment in my apartment apartment building so I can kind of look after you a little bit and you can help me out we can we had four cartoonists by the end of my wife throwing me out we had four different cartoonists living in that building <laughs> but, um, uh, the the man spider thing has been reprinted I think three times by Marvel because they've never done anything with it I think it has something to do with the fact I wrote it and drew it and because I did it during the uh period where you had to sign the back of your check. Uh, when, when you did, and this is the last question, and then I'll take it back up with uh, Captain Carrot when I come back. But um, when you did the, um, when you were associated with Destroy Your Duck, were you at all concerned you were building, uh, burning a bridge or that Marvel was going to be mad at you for any association? I know you were friends with both Gerber and, and Kirby, so it was a natural thing for you to contribute to. Well, I was an underground cartoonist. I didn't care whether Marvel liked me or not. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I kind of assumed if they want to hire me, it's going to be on my, my ability, but that never was a problem. I mean, I wanted to support, if, if you know, Steve, and if Jack Kirby was in on it, it, it was fine with me, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. 
And can you talk about that? Uh, because not everybody's had access to and has, has read that. What was the what was the the uh, story that you did for the first issue of Destroy Your Doc? No, I just I just inked it. Really, it was something that that Marty Pasco had written, and uh, uh, I was really excited though to ink Joe Staten because he was one of the few guys that was. I think I bought the first issue of Primus because it was like, whoa, this guy, this guy draws differently. He kind of draws the way I draw. If I yeah. Just, like a cartoon, like a cartoon, yeah. Yeah, we did. We did an interview with him. It was it was one of my favorites. I'm I'm a huge fan of his work, going all the way back to the beginning as well. We have, have something in common in that. Well, a couple things. One is that we both got to grow up to draw our favorite characters. Yeah. And, and uh, but also when uh, after Roy and I had developed Captain Carrot to a certain degree and had pitched it to DC, and they seemed to want to do it because they kind of asked Roy to come up with something that they might be able to do as a cartoon show. Um, uh, they, without telling me, they went to some other people, including Joe, and asked them if they'd like to draw it. So I assume they were kind of planning to rip me off. Hmm. And uh, By the way, I'm not mad at Marvel about anything. DC is a whole nother story. Hmm. <laughs> we'll get to that. Since I don't expect to get a call from many soon, I'm happy to talk about that one. But, uh, yeah, the... Uh, and, and then Joe Orlando came back to me and he had all these drawings of the characters drawn in a DC Comics, you know, pseudo Jack Kirby style, as opposed to the way I drew them, which looked like cartoon characters. Mm -hmm. Then I suddenly had to learn how to be their, you know, cartoon George Perez. And that's kind of why I, I ultimately lost the gig because I just couldn't draw fast enough to add all that useless detail on everything. I see. I mean, they wanted it to look a certain way, and I really did my best to deliver, but I couldn't. I had, and, and besides, they kept saying, if you meet your deadlines, we'll pay you more. I said, no, I have to take other jobs to meet my rent deadlines. So yeah. that, that was another problem. I mean, I, was, I wasn't young enough to have three roommates like most young comic book artists. Yeah, that story by uh, Marty Pascal, that Staten penciled and you inked, that's the the satire of Alex Toe throwing Julie Schwartz out the window, right? Or Bob Kaniger or whoever you might want to think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, the original story is just a check issue between Toth and Schwartz, but then Staten drew Kaniger out the window uh, in that story. Yeah. Well, I've heard the story told so many ways. I think, I think he just decided let's make it an amalgam of the two best known. Of the two people that were kind of there. Yeah, and then did Staten draw the French hat on Toth, or did you add that? No, he was wearing a beret when I canceled. I didn't add anything. <laughs> but what's funny is, it's always the guy that's going to get thrown out the window that changes. It's always Toth. <laughs> yeah, it's always <laughs> Toth doing it. Did you know Toth, too? Because he was out on the West Coast also. Yeah, he was at Hanna-Barbera when I was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, he, you know, he was one of the... He, he was, I think, bipolar. He, he'd go by, I'd go hang out in his office with him once in a while. We'd be talking and stuff. He was very friendly. Next day, he'd walk by me and kind of, Scott Shaw, hmm, and stick his nose up in the air. Really? Like he decided I was a communist overnight or something. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and I'm not, everybody I know is like that. You know, he likes you, and then he decides he doesn't like you. Yeah. It was I've, a read, I've read and heard that. Yeah, because, I mean, he was one of those guys that, that fans didn't really notice, but other cartoonists respected Alex tremendously. Sure. Rightfully so. Yeah, and he could do a little bit of everything. Yeah, and talented. He was so hard on himself, though. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, if he didn't like the way... You know why everybody has a, 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 a... Everybody that has a page that Alex gave him is always out of the Lost World um, adaptation because he hated it. Hmm. So he he gave he just give those away to anybody he knew. Oh, that's funny. I have the art. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, Mark. One day, Mark Mark Evan and I were going to go up to see uh, Alex. Mark had set it up at his house, and it was up by the Hollywood Bowl. So we get up there and we knock. Mark raps on the door. Nobody answers. Nobody answers. We weren't bearing groceries. I don't think. I mean, he used to. Have, 
invite people in if they brought him groceries. But Alex, you know, just would have these moods or he didn't want to talk to anybody. So I don't know what Mark had, but he brought something for Alex. So we go back out to Mark's car. He opens up the trunk of his car. He puts something in. The trunk's still open. And this car pulls up that has a realtor sign on the side. Do you boys know where to find so-and-so? And Mark says, no, we don't live in this neighborhood, so we don't know. And I said, yeah, anyway, we're just doing a drug deal. And the car peels out of there. I've never seen Mark without a comment. He looked <laughs> He, he, he didn't look mad. He didn't look, he just looked like, what, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. So at least Alex gave me a funny story. That's funny. All right, Alex, uh, you, you want to um, start to cover the animation part? Yeah, sure. So um, as you're doing the Hanna-Barbera comics, you were then hired as layout and character designer for the 1979 new Fred and Barney show. Is that, is that right? And how'd that come about? Um, I got a call one day, and I don't remember who it was from, but they asked me if I was interested in coming and working in Hanna-Barbera, and I, I really didn't know what to say because I was, you know, working a freelancer, and I was young, and it was like, wow, I get to hang out, I can draw in my underwear, I can sleep in late, I can work yeah, all perfect. I, I don't know if I want to you know, punch a clock again. Yeah. They said, well, I, I don't know. They said, well, we're going to be doing a new Flintstones show. I said, when do I start? Yeah, because you like the Flintstones, yeah. I mean, and, 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 and people think I just innately like anything Flintstones. As I've gotten older, it's really, I just like about the first two and a half years of the show. Which you say, yeah. I like the best comic books. I like the best toys. But... You know, it's not like Hanna-Barbera ever strove for perfection. So an awful lot of that stuff, that's like, you don't know how many people on Facebook send me pictures of people with shitty Flintstones cars. It's like, please, no more of those. <laughs> you hear that, ladies and gentlemen, no more. Yes, I, I know what the real one looks like. You don't need to show me anybody trying to make it look like that. But, <laughs> but uh, you know... Uh, the, the Hanna-Barbera thing, um, when I, they, they brought me in almost immediately, but it wasn't to work on the Flintstones. Mm -hmm. they, they hadn't gotten the go-ahead yet, so they didn't even have any scripts yet, but they knew it was a sale. Right. Trying to line people up for it. And uh, they had seen my stuff on the comic books, and they liked my comics, They they which is interesting because the year uh, – I mean, I don't know how many years, maybe three or four years before when I came up to make my first big trip to LA to show off my portfolio. Mm -hmm. I had Hanna Barbera, who was an ex Marine, and apparently everybody said he was the meanest son of a bitch in the place. Oh. And me, like he was my grandfather, and he was an ex Marine, and I was a hippie. And yet, because I think because I was so used to being a Navy kid, I was so used to calling him sir. Yeah, yeah, because your dad was in the military. Maybe I messed with him. He's like, why is this hippie respecting me? But in any event, he was very kind, and he said, look, I just don't think that you're ready. You're showing me stuff that's underground comic type stuff. We need, you to, we need to see drawings of you drawing our characters. And I was like, oh, I never even thought about that. You know, can't you tell that I can draw them? No. I so, uh that poor man, by the way, died on the toilet at Anna Barbera. <laughs> he lived and breathed his work, it sounds like, and digested his work as well. He was grinding out some more work for Anna Barbera. Um, anyway, the uh, uh, job turned out to be in layout, but they also were having me do a lot of uh, character and prop design. Mm -hmm. and they realized that they were trying to find out what my strengths were, and they were trying to train me at the same time. And um, that happened the entire time I worked for Hanna-Barbera. I left for a while to do Captain Carrot, and then I came back after that, after working at Marvel. Mm -hmm. They never, I saw people around me get fired or laid off all the time. Yeah. It was just a part of animation. Everybody has to, you know, spend the summer doing something else because we don't get the pickups until late summer, you know, mm. start getting the shows ready. Um, 
And I never realized until many, many years later that Bill and Joe showed a great uh, loyalty to me because they were trying to train me. I mean, I went from being a layout guy to a producer. Right. They saw the potential. Right. They wanted you to use your, use your talents. Boy, Norman got laid off and I was kept on. And I'm thinking, and he was my roommate. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? Because Floyd had done all kinds of things. He knew how to make cartoons. He had his own studio at one time. And uh, I'm just a kid. Why are you keeping me? But they yeah. had publicity. They had me working in presentation. I eventually became a writer. And I thought, they're just... They're just making sure I do every job in the place, but animate because by that time I would have had to been Asian to be animating them because they were sending them all over to Asia. Overseas. Oh, okay. So, uh, but you know, they, that was kind of my version of college. Hmm. I was having too much in college and fun in college to learn anything, but at hmm. Hannah, it was like, I was so happy to be there. A lot of the old timers, I mean, I worked with guys, not only worked with them, but they had to kind of show me their work. And I think that was one reason I was given that job to be a, a layout supervisor, was that way I'd be exposed to guys that knew what they were doing. Nice. And some of these guys had worked on Snow White and Pinocchio. Yeah. So these are, are they, what, the seven old men or something? No, oh, no, none of them were there, but... Uh, but guys that had long histories with everything. Yeah. I mean, at one time, there weren't people trying to get into animation. It was, it was kind of a finite uh, society. So if a guy quit at one studio, it was like musical chairs. Okay, well, somebody, somebody go over there. You know, it's just like, oh, I want to see my different group of buddies at the other side. Right, studio. right. Now kids are being told it's like being a rock star and, you know, I think I, 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 I usually actually try not to tell kids, oh, you're going to get a job. I say, you know, do this for fun. And if you get a job, that's bonus. Yeah. Because that's a much more realistic thing now. Yes. But anyway, um, these guys thought it was hilarious that I was so impressed to be working with them because I knew all their names from the old Hanna-Barbera uh, credits. Nice. They, they were kind of laughing behind my back, but not in a, a put-down way. Yeah. They, thought it was so, they felt like, who is this kid? He actually thinks that this place makes good cartoons, you know? <laughs> By that time, I knew they weren't making good cartoons, but those guys taught me how to draw. Yeah. That's when my work started getting better. Nice. It wasn't, it wasn't good yet, but it was getting a lot better because I was looking at and working with people who had forgotten more than I'll ever know. Yeah. And Fitzgerald was there, for example. Who was? Owen Fitzgerald, who did a lot of comic books and really good comic books. Jack Manning was there. Pete Alvarado was there. I was working with all them. Um, also, there were guys like um, Tony Rivera, who had been a layout guy at Hanna-Barbera since the very beginning. Wow. He one time came in, Floyd's sitting there, and we're checking layouts and writing stuff down and Tony comes in and he pretends to be confused. Yeah. He was an old guy and, but he wasn't confused. He knew what he was doing. And he said, Scott, he came and made his voice sound kind of like he was more helpless. It was like, well, that's bullshit, Tony. But he comes in, he goes, I need some help on this layout. And it was a, a, a pan. And uh, I forget exactly what the element was, but it was what we called a bicycle. Thing. So one thing is holding still while we're panning by and other things are passing through. And so you had to do it on certain pegs because the camera guys needed to be able to shift the stuff around so it wasn't uh, a problem for them to have to re-peg everything. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he does it three different ways and shows, spreads them out and shows them to me. And I'm like, why is he asking me? And then it clicks on, no, he's teaching you, you idiot. Pay attention. Wow. <laughs> he's dancing. So what do you think? And I said, well, Tony, I said, the way you're showing this, this is the only way that makes any sense, right? And he looks up at Flay and goes, ah, oh, this kid's good. And just walks out of the room. It's like he didn't get paid for that. Nobody said, hey, Tony, would you show Scott how to do this? Yeah. I like that then. Now it's kind of like, you know, the Thunderdome, everybody's trying to 
get everybody else's job and everybody's looking over the shoulder. Right. They're afraid. And, and two, studios are no longer like a cartoon studio where you can pin stuff up on the walls and print practical jokes on each other. I mean, we weren't term, termite terrorists, but we got pretty rowdy at times. But Bill and Joe understood one thing. Leave us alone. If we're hitting their marks and we're not asking for mo more money, leave them alone. Right. That we were all yeah. overage children. You know, even the yeah, yeah. get into it, we're laughing their asses off at some of the we had a contest once to see who could cause the biggest crash so they'd hear it downstairs in the ink and paint department. <laughs> that was our goal during the day, not getting the work done. That we just did. Yeah. But you know, nobody Floyd once told me this, and coming from a guy with his experience means a lot. He said that of all the studios he worked in, he didn't look forward to going to any studio like he looked forward to coming in H and B every day. That's so cool. That, that was my break into the business. Yeah, yeah, that's where the connections start. So then, now in the '80s, Harvey Comics basically fallen apart, but the Richie Rich cartoon went from uh, 1980 to 1984, and you had that, some involvement in that as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I helped develop it. Uh -huh. uh, I think they knew because I'd worked in comics that I might see some things. And I, I did actually was responsible for the show, at least the backgrounds looking more like the comic. But, you know, it wasn't my idea to uh, trace Dollar the Dog's features over a model of Pluto, for example. Mm. Who did it? I'm not saying. Um, they did have a problem with Richie Rich's age. And the main reason for that wasn't his age in particular. They didn't like the idea that his head was like three times bigger than his father's. <laughs> you know, in the comic, they always kind of have him in the foreground and the dad in the background, or the dad in the foreground, the kid way in the background. So you aren't really noticing him standing together. But in Saturday morning, there's a lot of characters who are just kind of standing on the same lines at each other, looking at each other. In the same layer, yeah. So, I had, in the development, I had to draw Richie at six-month intervals between the ages of six and 16, which was really hard. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like, how do you age somebody that barely has any features? You know? Yeah. With that Dagwood haircut, maybe you do something. Like <laughs> but uh, it, it, it sold, and then they came to me, and they had me develop a baby Huey thing. And I... I had mixed feelings about that because I always, I never liked Richie Rich as a kid either. I, I was a big uncle Scrooge fan. So it wasn't the money thing. It was just Harvey comics. Even as a kid struck me as the comics that your grandmother would give you. Yeah. Right. They were just too babyish for me. Even when I was practically a baby, it was like, they're well drawn, they're well written, but they're just too safe. You know? Yeah. Oh, I do have one that, that shows that those guys were reading other comics. I've got one where, where Casper, it's, I think it's Casper or Spooky, but the monster is named, it's a big swamp monster named Voodoo Doo. <laughs> <laughs> People comment on me drawing the turd. I go, hey, here's a Harvey comic that's done. Voodoo Doo, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's clever. I like that. <laughs> well, don't tell Bob Overstreet, he'll mark it up. <laughs> So now, um, also another cartoon I really loved as a kid, and and actually the the new Fred and Barney, Richie Rich, and then this next one, Muppet Babies. I mean, I watched all that stuff, you know, as a kid. Um, formative for me because I didn't really read the Hot Read comics, but I watched the cartoons. But let's talk a little bit about the Muppet Babies. Now that went from 1984 to 1991. I love that there was like old black and white clips of old movies like mixed in to it. Like that was actually, I think where I got, where I, where I actually figured out that there was a universal monsters cause it would have stuff like that. Tell us about, um, uh, your involvement in the Muppet babies cartoon. I, uh, was always a fan of the Muppets, but I really became a fan of the Muppets once I was working on that show. Um, we never worked directly with Jim Henson. Uh, Michael Frith was the main guy that we worked with, who was one of the guys that had been with Henson's company for years, and he was an outstanding illustrator himself. Mm -hmm. 
lots of kids books and lots of the Sesame Street books and things like that. he kind of did the ones that Jack Davis didn't do there in the when they first were new oh cool anyway uh, we would get very thoughtful notes we were dealing with people who'd never worked for Saturday morning who'd never worked for the cheaper tawdrier aspects of, of kids entertainment and by the way, when when when, uh, when Sesame Street came out, I was in college, and I'd lay in bed all day on Saturday. They'd show all of them, you know, for the week, and I was convinced this is going to change animation forever. Every every show is going to be in a completely different style. No, that didn't happen, and I wound up at Hanna Barbera, so there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the um, the Muppet thing, yeah. Had a, first of all, we had a producer who understood. He never said this. He wasn't the kind of guy that'd make little speeches. But essentially, he made it clear that a good guy, a good idea is a good idea. It doesn't matter where it came from. Mm-hmm. He would. There was a season, for example, where he told everybody. I think it was. I think it was the second season. We we had an hour's worth to do for each week. Yeah. So, a half hour showed an hour when we got our first Emmy and the, and the ratings were good too. Um, but uh, he was higher. He, he was buying uh, springboards. He was paying, I think a hundred dollars for springboards. He would paint out of his own pocket, but uh, some of the assistant uh, gophers were getting him. They became writers. One of the editors did him. He got, and I became a writer from that too. And, um, I had been writing anyway, but it was the first time somebody said, hey, we'd like you to write this. And what it was, was uh, this was a good example, too, of everything. I mean, I switched around. So I was also the, the, the overseer of the, the model sheets. By the way, Chris Sanders, the guy created Leo and Stitch, he was, I was his first boss. Oh, yeah? That's cool. Yeah, he's still speaking to me, so I guess it was okay. Sounds like it was a positive experience. Uh, yeah, but... Uh, uh, they had, this was fairly far in on Muppet Babies. And this was at the same time that Marvel had taken on a ton of work relating to toys. And they also made a deal with King Features to do this, in my opinion, terrible show that was kind of a ripoff in a way of, of uh, Masters of the Universe called uh, Defenders of the Earth, I think. Yeah. And it was kind of like all their classic quasi superheroes mandrake the magician and, yes. the and i forget who flash I gordon was in it too they were smart they would have added popeye yeah yeah, yeah. Anyway, they were all fighting ming the merciless and they all had right. teenage sidekicks and it was just horrible right everybody at the studio assumed that oh we have the rights to flash gordon now they didn't seem to understand how these contracts work where no it's for this particular project you have the rights to flash gordon they thought we had so they wrote and it went through a script that was all muppet baby stuff based on one specific flash gordon uh serial oh and so we get the whole thing boarded and the producer gets a call and he calls me he says guess what we can't use that movie because we never signed for it yeah so he said, but we have something you might like even better. And it was, um, the name of it, it was, it was um, Gene Autry's Ra- Radio Ranch in the Phantom Empire. Hmm. And it was, was about, it was a sci-fi Western. Yeah. His, his radio ranch, where he broadcast his radio show from, is being attacked by creatures and people who live at the center of the earth, who have robots wearing metal cowboy hats, and they're coming up to the surface, and then they're going out and doing bad stuff, and then going back down. And it was the it was so much better than Flash Gordon. Oh, cool. There was so much great corny stuff in there. Sanguli would have worn himself out making jokes about this thing. So, I mean, even down to the fact they're going to Planet X, so I just had a big planet with an X on it. Um, And that was my first official job as a writer. I'd been writing at Hanna-Barbera, but it was just mainly gags and stuff like that, punching up. I wrote a Smurf script 
that got heavily rewritten because I wrote it way too long. Okay. Because I was writing all the instructions to the board man. And they, that's not how we do it. It's like, well, I'm a board man. I figure I've got to give him some. I always would have appreciated if somebody told me how, how they'd like it changed. Mm-hmm. But, uh, anyway, I wrote a little, but that was the first one that really, my work really kind of got on the end. Of that. That's pretty cool. So then, uh, so the black and white movies that they would splice in with Muppet Babies, the, were, they had to get licenses to do that? Yeah, but a lot of it was just done on a handshake with, with uh, I mean, we got to use the Indi- stuff from the second Indiana Jones movie just because, you know, all those directors and Henson were all pals. They're all pals anyway, yeah. And, and I've heard, I don't know if this is the truth, but... I've heard that that's the reason they've never been formal, form, formally introduced on home video. I was going to ask that because you can only get it like in bad quality on YouTube or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or comic con. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Bootleg. Yeah. Cause you can't, uh, you can't get it uh, because, and I was thinking probably cause of that license stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had ghostbusters. We, I, I boarded the very first star Wars episode. Oh, wow. I also, the one I enjoyed the most was this was back when our story editor was Jeff Scott, who was Mo Howard's grandson. So at the time, it, was, it changed after that significantly, but his family was more or less in control of everything. Mm-hmm. He got us the rights to use the Three Stooges. Oh, and cool. I had to do a board where it was Fozzie Bear in a pie fight with the Three Stooges. Yeah the footage from one wasn't enough i got to take i think there are three or four three stooges of pie fights i got to like you know bastardize all of them and cut them apart and (laughs) you know i thought god when did i get to work with the three stooges this is absolutely the greatest thing ever it is i I once had a dream my wife woke me up because laughing what are you laughing i said i dreamt the three stooges came to visit me and all i kept saying is but you're dead (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you're dead it can't be real um but you know muppet babies was great because a generation x kid like me could actually see like old 30s 40s 50s movie footage and then for me it was like a gateway to try to find out what that stuff was all about well that's the thing we we aimed at the kids who are aspirational in terms of when I was a kid, for example, getting Mad Magazine, I didn't know what the political stuff was. I started reading the papers so I wouldn't know who these people were. Yeah. I mean, the dummies are just going to go, well, that's funny. So, you, so if you're smart, you're going to write it on a number of levels. Yeah. But the Muppet Babies episodes I love the most, and I didn't even work on these, are the ones where they go to the art museum and they got actually the, I don't know if you remember, but they actually have like some little... <laughs> Chirons in some scenes where it says who actually owns the, the rights to this. And and the one I like the most is where they talk about the history of cartoons. Yeah. We love yeah. cartoons. You know, you know the one. And they're all dressed up as Popeye and all. That almost makes me cry. Yeah. I, I, it actually gets me emotional because that's like the foundation of my pop cultural curiosity was, I think Muppet Babies was that because I was like six when it came out. And I was like, I need to find out who all these characters are. And that was like the beginning for me to be curious about old Hollywood and all sorts of stuff. After a certain point, the producer just started giving me song sequences because I like doing those because they just give you a song and say, here, come up with the visuals. Yeah. And anything. And the one that I thought was the most successful that I did was the one where Gonzo was singing about being a semi weirdo. And we, <laughs> Uh, kind of parodies of a lot of Magritte paintings. Yeah. I mean, uh, my producer suggested, they says, why don't you take a look at Magritte? That might give you some ideas. Yeah, right. I mean, he, his name is Bob Richardson. He's still around. And, and he was like a guy that kind of, without intentionally doing it, he kind of set kind of how I should be if I ever got the job as producer. Oh, nice. Well, but he was constantly in, fights with management about deadlines and stuff because he said, wait a second, we're expected to make this thing good. It's Jim Hansen. You know? Yeah. They, That's we right. had a second show that got canceled after I think two episodes because we did it on the fly and it was terrible. It was called Little Muppet Monsters. Oh, okay. 
meme on YouTube, but it was a real poorly thought out, you know, kind of thing to extend the brand, but not, it, it just felt artificial as hell. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I remember, uh, even like the, uh, the Wolfman and the, uh, the, all, all the old, uh, Dracula footage, um, all that stuff. It was all introduced to me through Muppet Babies. All right. So then 1987, uh, Popeye and Son. Why was it only 13 episodes? Because it was Popeye and Son. <laughs> that, that's probably the most loathed cartoon ever in existence, other than that new one that King Features is doing by yeah. Popeye. Because, I mean, they got Bobby London to do character sketches and rejected them. That's how oblivious H&B and CBS were to it. I see. I was a writer by that time. And I submitted, I don't know, maybe a dozen springboards. And every, actually, no, not only springboards, but I think three or four scripts. And each one would just come back on the script, scrawled across it, goes too far. Yeah. I kept using it because it's like I thought, well, for example, one of them I thought, well, Popeye can't be punching people. And they said that if it was something that the uh, standards and practices said was a non-imitatable action, they might consider it. So I had a story that I was really pleased with where Bluto does something to Popeye's spinach patch, thinking he's going to kill all the spinach. But instead, it makes him into super spinach. And when Popeye eats it, he's kind of like the Hulk now. He's like really yeah. open. Then they both eat it. And, then they're and in the show... Bluto was a used car salesman, so I wrote it so it happened. And the, so then they're having a fight, beat, trying to hit each other with used cars. <laughs> and they hate they you can't do that. Well, neither can kids, shouldn't that? No, you can't. That goes too far. I mean, I had one set at the circus. I had, you know, it was like, I thought, okay, if you can't be punching people, yeah, that's aggressive. But, but they didn't seem to want anything going on. And the one that finally made it through was one on the Jeep. And I had the whole Jeep take place in the fourth or fifth dimension. I forget which dimension. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they said, no, it can't be that. Kids don't know what the fifth dimension is. I said, neither do we. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know either. But no. it's, a great, it's a great concept to introduce. Yeah. And it was all about um, Popeye's son is going, going to his first prom, junior prom, and he buys an orchid for somebody, and the Jeep grabs the orchid because the Jeep eats orchid. And he's chasing him, and then he just goes into a portal, and he jumps in after him. So it all took place on in Sweet Haven, and it was just horrible. I, and I'll never forget, I was at the table read, and uh, the guy that does it did, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Don Messick, famous voice guy, sitting there, and he looks up, and he goes, what the fuck is a Jeep? I know. <laughs> So, it was, nobody was that happy about the show obviously that's cool yeah the uh sorry i had to click my thing for a second um, Wait, you suddenly given me a very stern look there i, <laughs> I thought everything was frozen <laughs> um so now um okay so garfield and friends 1988 were you working on was you were you and evan you're working on that together well, only in that I was doing his scripts. He, he, we weren't. I wasn't working on the scripts, and he wasn't working on the boards. But uh, I'll tell you, having worked in animation for an awful long time, I can tell you that most animation writers do not have a sense of the visual. When I was at Marvel, I didn't have to do it because I think it was from a Transformers or GI Joe. But somebody. Everybody was moaning about it. Somebody was given a script in which there was a fight between two jets inside a circus tent. So there you go. And, it, and sometimes it's just simple stuff too, like having a guy climb a ladder carrying 15 different things at the same time. And you can't even do that for comedy's sake. How is he going to hold, what's he hold on to going up a ladder? Yeah. Somebody going up and down 500 times to take all this so it's like, it's like when Mark was doing scripts, you could plus them. You could add little funny bits here and there. They didn't need too many, but you could sort of stage it in a funnier way than he described. Right. But most scripts, you're just trying to fix them so they work at all. 
because even the best writers are just, they're just writing words. They're not thinking about it in pictures the way cartoonists write. Mm -hmm. John Chris Felucci has milked that to death about nobody should be hired as writers in animation. I don't think that. I just want to get writers that, that know how to visualize like Mark. Yeah, picture it, yeah. The only other guy I knew that wrote that well was a fellow that's no longer with us named Earl Kress, who was a friend of Mark's. But, uh, now, there are, now, these two projects are really interesting. Um, because it, it has like some involvement in like SCTV um, Canadian uh, comedians and things. You got Ed Grimley, 1988. Uh, Ed Grimley, 1988 with uh, Martin Short, who voiced Ed Grimley. Eugene Levy and some other SCTV people were kind of in it every now and then. And you also have... Eugene was in it once. But we, our main staff was, of course, Martin, um, Andrea Martin... Catherine O'Hara, Joe Flaherty, and Jonathan Winters. Yeah. Wow. And as much as I loved SCTV, working with Jonathan was the big one for me. Mm -hmm. He was my first uh, hero that wasn't a cartoonist. I didn't know he was also a cartoonist at the time. Since then, he's given me his cartoons and even a painting. Oh, wow. But we worked together on a book that never got published. But uh, yeah, Ed Grimley was one of those things that was picked up at the very last minute, the very last minute. So, and I'd never produced anything. They kind of set me up with another producer who didn't do anything. But he and he was a nice guy who also drew comics named uh, Kay Wright. He did the uh, he did the Junior Woodchucks that Carl Barks wrote. He worked over Barks' layouts. Oh, so we, cool! So we always had lots to talk about when I was in his office, at least. Yeah. In fact, he drew the first uh, Anna Barbera comic that I inked. But the Grimley thing was—I um, wish I could say it was fun. It was fun at times, but I think it's the closest I've ever come to a nervous breakdown. Oh, really? Because. I could not adjust to the idea of turning out something and knowing how, how uh, many flaws were in. And uh, the first episode was done in three different studios at once, which is never a good idea because things don't hook up or match. Mm -hmm. They were all in the Orient. I think two were in the Philippines and one was in Taipei. Mm, the studios. Um, it came back about a week before it went on the air, which was probably the biggest margin I've ever had to fix something for a show. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget though, this was because of this, probably my most significant experience in animation happened. Bill Hanna and I, Bill was showing me how to edit a film. I'd never actually physically done it. And this was before, avids and stuff this is when we were just literally cutting film and splicing it together and because martin short refused to let us cut anything in the script this show went out 600 feet long which is like making another cartoon practically right so we had to figure out what to keep what you know it was like taking a steak and turning it into hot dogs because a lot of the connective stuff was just missing but um we got the thing it kind of worked. All the characters' mouths were saying the right voices, which is a big problem coming from overseas. And I thought, you know, this looks pretty good. This looks more or less like the board we intended. And uh, he was kind of making the poses that we wanted. So we were delighted. So I wasn't there. I, I actually, uh, I left early one Friday because it was, uh, the next day was my birthday. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go home at three o'clock and just take a nap. Mm -hmm. I get a call about five o'clock waking me up out of the nap. You got to get over here. Martin Short's throwing a tantrum. Oh, he is. And indeed he was, <laughs> uh, he was very upset and I can understand why, because he was told that this was going to look like the finest Warner brothers cartoons by the executive producer. And, uh, 
executive producer never took responsibility for that. So I had to keep Martin Short happy. And as we worked together, Martin became happier and happier with my work. We had to do a movie and uh, we kind of had time to catch up on our scripts. So when he came back from the movie, I had come up with a scheme. And what happened was I would go over to his house with the, with the new script and I'd videotape him reading any of the scenes that weren't him being chased or doing something mm. really cartoony. I'd have him act it out. Then I asked one of my best artists, the guy that did the Ed Grimley design that we wound up using, sculptor actually, um, he gave me all these uh, extreme poses that Ed Grimley hits. Because Martin Short seemed to think that people overseas all knew who Ed Grimley was. And we had to point out, say, no, they probably don't. And even if they do, we want them to do it the right way. So I really, really found a way that worked, and he was happy with it. The, they didn't uh, rotoscope it. What they would do is, this is just where to see. On this word, he hits this pose. On, and on the sheets, we just put the, the uh, we lettered all the poses. Okay, goes from E to B, then back to E, then to F, and timed it. So suddenly, he was delighted with the show. And that's why I wound up working on John Candy's show because Martin Short recommended me to John Candy. Okay, so that's how that happened with Cam Candy then. And we would have gotten a second season of Ed Grimley at Me TV, but Bill Hanna had so many problems trying to get the scheduling because Short was still making movies and stuff. He said, I'm never doing that show again. Oh, I see. Yeah, There's too much logistically to balance. So just, then Cam Candy went from 89 to 92 and... And John Candy now was part of that production. So how did that compare to the Grimley show? Well, I always wished that we had done it at, at uh, Hanna-Barbera because John was always there. He was easy to work with. And uh, uh, Martin was easy to work with too, but his schedule was crazy. But uh, John and I became really good friends. Oh, yeah? I found out years later that one reason I was hired wasn't just because of Martin Schwartz uh, recommendation. At the time I weighed over 400 pounds. Oh, I hope that that would reassure John because, you know, people just looked at us as freaks, I think. And, but what it was, it actually worked out great because again, it was a very late pickup from this NBC, same, same network. And, um, I thought, I'm not going to waste any time trying to please John. I'm going to find out what he doesn't like, and pay, he'll find something he likes. So I thought, I know lots of cartoonists. I was given $10,000 as development money. I hired a guy to do backgrounds, and the rest of the money, I, go, I called my cartoonist buddies. I said, give me $500 worth of drawings, just sketches of how you would draw John Candy. For most of my friends, that was about a half day's work. So I figured we're gonna we're gonna have a winner and, and many losers. He hated them all. Everybody drew John like a mudslide. It it was you know people, I guess understandably focused on his weight instead of his face. Mm. He hated every one of them. So I went home and I'm like I told Judy I said man I am screwed. I I could, now I've got to figure it out and I've got to figure it out fast. She she said as she often does, very smart things. She said, why don't you just draw them the kind of the same way you draw yourself on your business card? I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, you kind of draw yourself fat, but you kind of draw yourself as Fred Flintstone fat rather than morbid fat. <laughs> didn't say like you've got, but I mean I was. But in, in any event, I whipped something up. John loved it. I thought, shit, I could have paid myself $10,000 for one drawing. Yeah. But, uh, it worked out that way. And, 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 you know, John was a comic collector when he was a kid. Um, uh, when he was, when he died, I was in the process of trying to get together some of the comics on a list that he told me he'd like to have again. And we were, we had, uh, the last thing time we met was with, um, Christopher Columbus. No, it was John Hughes. It wasn't Christopher, Columbus, John Hughes. 
And the three of us discussed me producing and directing a series of shorts that would go in front of every John Candy movie with all of his characters from SCTV and new ones. And of course, yeah. that never happened. And I had a TV, um, a TV special called Halloween Candy that I'd plotted out for him that he wanted to do. But poor John left us. And he had a, his, hand, his family had a history of heart problems. So I think yeah. he just lived, lived the big life knowing that he was going to die young. His dad died when he was about 40 years old. Right that way going back for quite a while so but but that that making that movie is what killed him the uh the the atmosphere you know mexico city is a very elevated city and he just couldn't so then now after that you um worked on the 1994 fantastic four cartoon series and that one is my favorite of the fantastic four cartoons that have been made because a lot of the plots are straight from like the first 30 issues of the 1960s Kirby and Lee Fantastic Four. Um, and Stan Lee actually would do some intros um, in those episodes. And, and I loved, I loved those because it felt like I was reading the Marvel Masterworks all over again. Stan also did introductions for the first season, which was horrible. If you remember the first season. Yeah, that was a different, it was different. Yeah. Producer, same series. And, but but it, it really was because their new story editor and our producer, uh, Larry Larry Houston, an old friend of mine, was the producer who worked with Jack. And, mm -hmm. and he worked on the X-Men cartoon, too. Although, although because Jack was gone, he hired John Basima to do the models. So, I mean, he knew who the guys to get. And, excuse me, the only episode I worked on was what we call a cheater, where it used a lot of footage from other shows. So I had to come up with uh, scenes that were only with the Human Torch, the Super Scroll, Impossible Man, and Lockjaw, Lockjaw the uh, Dog. Yes, yeah. it was essentially a comedy episode, except for the flashbacks that were just clips from other cartoons. <laughs> so I really enjoyed working on the Impossible. Yeah, impossible man for sure. Because that's like like Plastic Man in a way. It's a cartoon character that you can put in a superhero strip. But I also was delighted because Fantastic Four is by far my favorite superhero concept, and I still will buy that comic till the day I die. I even bought the ones that Steve Englehart wrote, where they're wrestlers or something. I mean, it was like because sooner or later somebody, <laughs> you know, they don't need a gimmick. It's a family. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I like all those issues. Times, huh? <laughs> so now um, I'm just going to go through a quick checklist because we could go all day on this stuff because you, you're so prolific. But I want to knock through this checklist and Jim's going to go over um, convention stuff and some more comic stuff is just so the audience to know you worked on What's New Scooby-Doo in 2002, Duck Dodgers for the Cartoon Network 2003, Mickey's Twice Upon Christmas 2004, Mulan 2 2004. That was a busy year. Crypto Superdog, American Dragon, Jake Long, Jimmy Two Shoes. So, you you know, it, it's it sounds like just your skill set kept magnifying and building on itself as you were knocking out the next assignment, the next assignment. Well, I you know, I mean, I I like to do cartooning, and I like to do a lot of different things at any given time. It actually helps me keep organized. Mm. You know, I like having an animation job and a print job at the same time, or a writing job and a drawing job, job at the same time. Mm -hmm. right now, same time, yeah. The last couple of years, I've been illustrating a couple of children's books and then working on Uncle Comics and other gigs in my spare time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it keeps you fresh. It keeps you thinking. Otherwise, you just kind of fall into a funk. Yeah. I mean, I really understand why somebody you know, that had worked on a comic for a long time would request to be put on another comic just just to draw different characters. After a while, you feel like, God, I've drawn the thing in 800 poses and I know every one of them. So, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to feel like somebody that's touring that was a one-hit wonder that just has to play that same song over and over and over. Yeah, that could be its own nightmare, nightmare actually, yeah. yeah. Even when I do uh, commissions, I usually say, okay, do you want to, you want a happy Fred? You want a yelling Fred? You want an angry Fred? What? Because yeah. it's like I just like to keep enough variety so it doesn't become ordinary. Yeah, right. That's cool. 
giving myself little challenges. All right, Jim, go for it. Okay, uh, back to uh, Captain Carrot. Let's talk about the origin of that. Um, you had said that Roy Thomas uh, came to you. Um, did were the visuals and you had talked about DC interfering with that a little bit, but were the the designs mostly your creations? How did you and Thomas work together on this? Roy and I would get together with his wife Dan and have a spaghetti dinner at their house and then come up with ideas. And Captain Carrot actually did not originate with me. Roy had been planning on doing a Captain Carrot with Sam Granger back in the 60s. Uh, and Sam was a cartoonist who did the Sentinels back up, I think it was in Fight and Five or one of the DC, or one of the Charlton books. And I remember at the time I thought, that's like looking at me trying to draw Steranko because he was very cartoony. And then he wound up becoming an anchor at Marvel. But they never did anything with it. I think he did one drawing, like kind of a Mighty Mouse looking version of Captain Carrot. And I saw that long after I ever did my work on it. Um, but Roy, you know, we had been friends after since I worked on the What If story. And Roy used to throw lots of parties and stuff, and I'd be over at his house. And uh, we'd been talking about working on something else, and I don't know if he'd pitched it to DC, but I think DC had mentioned to him to come up with something that they could make into a cartoon show. And initially, we developed a thing called Super Squirrel and the Just a Lot of Animals, who actually wound up turning up in the comic a few times later. But they were based on, you know, the DC heroes. And then they came to us. I did a couple of pages of designs, and then I did a couple of, of uh, kind of tryout pages. I think I had, a, like, a giant carrot who looked like Galactus attacking their Earth. And um, then DC comes to us and says, well, we've changed our mind. We want you to create new characters, not characters based on our existing characters, because that's not really selling new IP, it's just a variation on it. And I thought, well, that kind of makes sense. So then Roy and I started kind of thinking about, well, what makes the, what do we need for, a, you know, your standard team? And created a bunch of characters between us with Dan's, a lot of input from Dan. You know, Jerry Conway uh, gets a credit on, or at least back when they were putting our name on it. And, uh, but I think that was just a deal between him and Roy because they, they were swapping points on other things that they'd created in DC. Um, so uh, we had a team and we had a couple extra characters we're thinking about. One was called Whirly Bird and one was Little Cheese, who we later brought in as, no, he's called Big Cheese. And then we turned, he, he was like Giant Man. And then we decided not to. But then I pointed out to her, I said, well, we need a big guy on the team, a guy that's like the, th the thing wasn't a big guy, but he was a muscle guy. And I said, besides, you need a bigger guy to stick in the background when you got them all together. And so that's, I came up with pig iron on my own. Oh, and I, oh that's interesting. Yeah, and, and I have to once again say, uh, even though I love Gilbert Shelton and Wonder Warthog, Wonder Warthog really had nothing to do with it. I came up with a name first. I was just trying to come up with puns. So uh, I, he, he, in no way uh, it was a ripoff of Wonder Warthog. And that those characters in that comic had a, a longevity that that is – is, I mean, it, it's a much loved comic for a lot of people of that particular uh, era and generation. Why do you think that's so? It has a lot of meaning to anyone as long as they don't work at DC Comics. Yes. I understand that. I have, I live 15 minutes away from DC Comics. I've never been even invited to come over to, to you know, sweep up the lawn, sweep up the floor from the, their shavings. Uh, I think D I think Captain Carrot is liked because it was unusual in its day. I think I've been told by a lot of kid, well, guys in their forties now, that it was kind of like an underground comic for kids. Because I was kind of listening to Jack Kirby about 
draw it your own way and yet at the same time imitating Jack Kirby because that was part of the concept that made it new and fresh in our minds was what if Mighty Mouse was drawn by Jack Kirby. And, uh, and I think uh, even, though the, the, even though I think there were too many puns, it got a little weary and quite honestly, when I wrote it, I wrote way too much dialogue because I was imitating Roy who, <laughs> but not knowing what I was doing. Roy wrote a lot of dialogue too, but not like me. Um, I really overdid it. But the, uh, um, the tone on the books, I kind of, tr we both kind of were trying to think of Carl Barks because even though they're fun and funny, there's kind of like some real stakes going on. They really, you know, it was an adventure story, like one of the longer Uncle Scrooges. It's an adventure story. It's not solved by a funny gag at the end. It's pretty straight with just, you know, pantless ducks running around. So, I mean, I, I kind of took, we both kind of had that attitude with Captain Carrot. It's like, let's make it straight. And then Jeff Johns came along and had little cheese killed. So then we really got, you know, like a superhero book. Now, did DC seem to have at least have some investment in it? In the, as I remember, the you had a sneak preview in like Teen Titans number one in, in the Wolfman Perez Teen Titans. Is that right? Yeah, that was how they were promoting all their new books, though. Yeah. Yeah, because Teen Titans was in got a, a a preview that way as well. But but sure. to put to put Captain Carrot in that, um, um, it would seem to indicate that they had some some hope for its success. Um, Carrot was never considered a kitty comic until yeah. until recently. Now they they re they uh they did a new a, a new version of it um not that long ago did um. Did they reach out to you at all? Did you have any? No, they didn't reach out to me in the slightest, nor Roy, nor Roy. They, uh, they, asked Bill, they asked Paul Dini if he knew anybody that would be good. And Paul Dini suggested my friend and at the time my editor at Bongo, Bill Morrison. And Bill Morrison <laughs> said, yeah, I can do it, but why haven't you asked Scott Shaw? They said, well, if that's who you want to work with, I guess you can work with him. And then he asked me, and then I did it. And I wound up actually kind of secretly co-writing a lot of it with him. And I didn't get paid a cent for that, but that was fine. I at least wanted to have some input into it. And Roy was understandably quite upset for quite a while. He, he you know, but, but it wasn't anything that Bill Morrison had engineered. They came to Bill. Um, Warner's, Warner's really let me down on that thing. It was supposed to be a six-issue comic. They, they actually uh, specified where it started and where it ended in terms of the plot because they wanted to tie it into uh, one of those mega events. It never tied into the mega event. Um, they said this will be considered a regular mainstream DC comic. Uh, they wound up paying me for the kids' rates. Uh, they said this will be a perfect superhero DC comic in the center spread. They put a 16 page commercial for uh, goldfish crackers that looked like it was written and drawn for children that couldn't read yet. Um, I'm not crazy about DC. It, and I, and it's, it's based primarily on uh, that's your, that's your interaction with DC that you, you said you, you have some grievances with. Well, the, or non-interaction with them. They haven't called me. They've published new Captain Carrot stuff. And if you've seen my work, I, I'm quite honestly, I draw better than I drew then. Yeah. But, you know, quite honestly, I'm, I'm getting a taste of, of the fact that comics were, treat, were created by gangsters, you know? So besides DC, and I... Um, well, let me ask it this way: Was was that experience with DC the the worst experience you've had in professional comics in terms of uh, being uh, ill treated or cheated? No, I think I think Archie's probably the king of that. That's that's where I was going with that because that actually uh, turned into litigation. Well, you got caught up in in 
Well, well no, I didn't get, I, I, I've, I've done some, uh, uh, what do they call not testimonials, but, uh, you know, depositions for him. But, uh, yeah, I, I did Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, I did the first issue, number zero, and the first uh, whole two issues after that, and I did, like, the cover for the number three. And um, they called me uh, They called me up and said, well, you know, would you like to do this? I was working at the ad agency at the time. But uh, I said, sure. I said, uh, and I wasn't a gamer. I didn't, it was, Sonic was a brand new character to me. In fact, I think it was America because um, one of the ways I was ripped off was I did uh, this whole no issue number zero. Nobody told me that they were going to be reprinting it to give away for free as advertising for the game at Toys R Us in millions of copies. So that's a second usage right there. They also did a third version, an eight-page version that they gave away. But that's not enough. At the time I was working in advertising, I was doing the Pebble serial commercials. I was also doing the Pebble serial comic book ads. I was also doing the, the boxes and the toys, but that's beside the point. Anyway, I was getting paid a very, very hefty uh, amount for each one page ad. And meanwhile, from Archie, I'm getting like $200 a page for, you know, no, I wouldn't even get that much. I, I didn't ink them. So I felt that, you know, when Archie started reprinting my stuff, I never signed any kind of a waiver. I didn't, I don't remember the check having the thing on the back saying, you know, I give away rights. But at that point, if I did get that, I crossed it out and cashed it anyway. They couldn't do anything about that. So... Archie is, uh, you know, they, they, they haven't just done that to me. There are a number of people whose work they constantly reprint who never signed any kind of a waiver. And that's why there have been so many people after them. And they aren't doing much of anything about it. I think, I think they may have settled with Ken Penders, the first guy that was doing it. And after that, you know. They do, yeah, Archie's an extremely, I mean, I love Archie comics, don't get me wrong, but the family nature of that outfit, there is an arrogance in that company that is unmatched. What was your experience with uh, Bongo comics? Nothing but good until Bill Morrison <laughs> left. <laughs> that never happened to me before. The new, the new editor just loathed my stuff. Never got a single, single, Thing. By the way, Sergio never got a single uh, assignment from me either, even though Sergio was working on the Simpsons comics at the time. Sergio Aragon is. Oh, yes. No, we, we knew who you were talking about. Wait, which reminds me, I, I wanted to ask you about the uh, um, uh, doing the Ramones project uh, for, for Rhino, because Sergio did that incredible piece on that, too. Uh, how did that come about? Well, I've been working for Rhino Records since the early 80s. Um, and uh, actually, the fellow that owned uh, Golden Apple Comics in Los Angeles recommended me to him, and it became a very happy uh, relationship. And uh, they, we had, I had talked with one of the art directors. He'd approached me about doing a whole book of Ramon's lyrics that were illustrated as though they were Dr. Seuss stories. And at the time, the uh, Rhino's uh, attorney said that there was no way Random House was ever going to let us get away with publishing an entire book that was drawn in Dr. Seuss's style. So we never did anything with it. And then uh, this Ramon's box set idea came up, and we realized, oh, well, we can do a number of covers. and. Uh, uh, mine wasn't one of the actual covers, but one of the one of one of the drawings of that "Hey Ho, Let's Go" is would have been the cover of the other book that never happened. And I wound up doing that and some of the lyrics on my own in a Dr. Seuss style. And then I also did something with Bobby London. We worked together on was a uh, 
a storyboard for a never sold um, Ramones cartoon that was essentially uh, it was all uh, it was all cat and mice. Bobby wanted to do something that would be the uh, be kind of like uh, Art Spiegelman's mouse, but 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 happier. Did you did you meet the Ramones in relation to this? Never met them. Never met them. No. Um, it seems like there's some interesting crossover. We've talked to a lot of people who have um, uh, Mary Fleener recently and and Bill Stout, where they they do that, where they 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 transfer uh, music into comics. Were you a a, a super interested uh, music person too? Well, I'm I've never been a musician, unlike them, but. Uh... Yeah, I did a really, what I think was a really cool comic. It was a five-page story. It was for the 50th issue of Critters from Fanagraphics. And Todd Rundgren has been my favorite musician for a long time. To me, he's kind of like a cartoonist with music. And uh, so I did an adaptation of a song of his called Onomatopoeia, where it's nothing but sound effects. So on each page, I've got 16 panels just to keep up with it. I, I think I sent you a copy of that. I, I've seen that. Yes, absolutely. I know that. I know. I knew it beforehand. I, I know that piece. Um, what about Streetwise? Well, what about it? <laughs> I, 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 I was asked to work on it. I'd been contributing some stuff to the Jack Kirby magazine that uh, John Morrow's Tomorrow's Company puts out. And he, he asked me to do something. And I think I did four strips and the third one was bumped just for space and that was a feature that i like to call now it can be told as though it's something important and obviously it's only because it's an important crap that only happened to me but it's all funny stuff that's happened to me or weird stuff or i i seem to be you know a weirdness magnet so i've got a lot of funny stories and that was my first batch and now i'm I've got an agent pitching a book of nothing but those. I'd like to, t I'd like to kind of have a basic autobiography, but it's not necessarily about what I've achieved. It's just of all the things that have happened. <laughs> you had um, you mentioned Sergio a few minutes ago. Is um, the two of you seem to travel in in similar pathways in terms of both being very very funny in 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 terms of your your comics and things. Um, do you know him very well? Well, I, I would imagine Sergio probably has 500 people who say he's their best friend, but he's certainly one of my best friends. That's, that's what I thought. We talk on the phone all the time. He doesn't stay up as late as, as he used to, but he's the only person I know that I can call at 3 o'clock in, in the morning if there's a really good Mexican monster movie on, and he'll pick up the phone and say, I've already got it on. You know, we, 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 we commiserate quite a lot, and he's – one of the, I'm so lucky to know the guy that I think is possibly the world's greatest cart, living cartoonist. I mean, there's just nobody like Sergio. Yes, and 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 yet people take him for granted to some degree in terms of just how skilled an artist he is. No, I don't think it's that. I think it's the fact that he is so uh, prolific. It's kind of like because I sit next to him at Comic Con. I have for years. People come up, you're my favorite artist. Oh, what's this? It's called Gru. They always kind of assume that he's always going to be there. I'll pick it up next time. I'll, be, I'll buy that in the graphic novel. Because he was out there every month in Mad and every month in comics for a long, long time. But as I said earlier, comic fans don't seem to want funny stuff. Comic fans want to be about Batman showing off his penis. That's right. their idea of entertainment now. And I'm not offended by it. I just think it's stupid. It's like, come on, you're going to get all of us without jobs if you keep doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't impressed with the penis at all, I got to say. Especially but, anybody that knows comic production knows that a number of people saw that before it went into print. So DC claiming they were surprised is complete oh, and nonsense. So uh, in closing about your comics, I want to I want to ask, what are some other because we could talk again, like your animation, we could go for hours more on this. Are there 
what would be other books or other works that you did that you would that you're especially proud of that you'd like if I if somebody said show me something by Scott Shaw, uh, comics wise, what would what would be the thing the other books besides the things that we we all know uh, that you would say this is I'm really proud of this work. In comic books. Well, I'm actually quite pleased with those ads I was doing for comic books for Pebbles because, again, I got to make them look good and kind of unusual and, and, and kids and people seem to remember me doing them. But, you know, I mean, I like doing those all camp now it can be told. I liked, um, I liked working for Bongo very much. I think those stories are, are, are a lot of fun, but the problem is most people – don't notice who wrote or draw anything if it's a licensed character like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I have any secret comic that I think is the, the great one that nobody ever looked at. I mean, I'm constantly grinding at me. I'll tell you one that I was really proud of that nobody's really seen. I did an eight page backup for Savage Dragon two years ago. And uh, mainly because I just like Savage Dragon, but it wasn't him. It was a, version that I was going to, I approached Le uh, Eric Larson with years ago about doing a special. So I thought, what if there was a character like Savage Dragon, but he was also like Little Archie. And uh, it's an eight page story I wrote and drew, and it's kind of me doing Little Archie without having to kiss, uh, kiss the ring of Archie comics. And uh, so few people saw copies. I don't think I even have a copy. Eric never got around to sending me any. So there you go. But it was a good story, and I don't think most people saw it. No, no. I, I called, don't think I have. It's called The Boy Without a Birthday. I will see it. And then it, finally, uh, I just want to go back to where we started with Comic Cons. Um, you've... You've never missed one up until this year. Is that right for San Diego? No, I missed one when I shattered my ankle. Okay. I missed the 215 one. And uh, now Mark likes to puff up and strut around and let everybody know that he's been to all of them. However, not that I'm trying to create any kind of a rift between Mark and I. We're also very, very close. But I've probably been to more days of Comic-Con because I know – there was a while where he had to go back for his mom and different things. So, so he, I, I remember there were certain comic cons where he was only there maybe one or two of the days of the whole thing. So it really doesn't matter. It's not like some, you know, no, we're amazing or genitals here, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 well, I, well, you're sitting, depends on, I can't see what you're wearing underneath. <laughs> there. Uh, it was, I'll tell you the worst thing about that was being in the hospital and at home and watching these, you know, TV faces pretend like, like, like attractive female models for one of the sports channels acting like they gave a damn about, and here's Captain America number one. And I mean, Comic Con has now been appropriated by people who are trying to be hip or trying to look like they're in on, the real thing and that drives me nuts it's like i'm not I, I i'm glad that this is no longer our little secret but i just wish that the people that didn't belong with comics would just leave us alone it, it, it's a tourist industry now and it, it wasn't i uh when i first started going that's that's for sure well well the other thing you have to understand is i've worked in entertainment in one way or another since the 1980s and I don't go to Comic Con for entertain for the entertainment industry. Therefore, I really, you know, resent it. But there's no way you can change it. They 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 can buy a table or a hundred tables just like anybody else. You can't ban Warner Brothers or a video game company or anybody from Comic Con. I just enjoy conventions that uh, have never attracted that kind of crowd in the first place. Right. I still love Comic-Con. This isn't a slam against that. But um, I'm just saying, after putting up with entertainment as a job, going down to Comic-Con kind of on a busman's holiday, I really don't want to have to watch entertainment beat its chest one more time. You know? 
What are, what are you asked to draw the most? Is it Sonic? Is it Captain Carrot? What, what are the most popular characters for you to uh, request? And does it depend on the age of the people asking? Yeah, it definitely depends on the age. The older people want Fred Flintstone. Um, the middle-aged people want Captain Carrot. And the kids that have heard that I do it want Sonic because it's the only character they've heard of. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true. Sounds about right. By the way, and, and last question: Did you read? Did you read the uh, Mark Russell Flintstones? And if so, what did you think of it? Um, it wasn't the Flintstones. First of all, the movie wasn't the Flintstones either, and that's how they drew them to look like movie characters. Yeah. By the way, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, Amanda Connor did the actual designs. I think she is brilliant. I love her work. She's great. Yeah. Is more up, and that's one thing comics now miss that she has. There is appeal in her work. You look at those characters, even the pro, as sleazy and depressing as it is. <laughs> boy, look at the expression on that person. Look at she doesn't just have the seven Salbacema poses and expressions, she really draws well. But the comic itself, it was like, don't look, I gotta tell you the truth. Warner Brothers instructed DC, you got to help us sell these characters. We don't know what to do with them. There was a lot of pressure being put on because DC suddenly realized we've got all this IP and we don't know how to sell it. The new Scoob movie may finally be a path for them to scale it, sell it because I'm not a Scooby fan, but that was decent. And I think people might be more interested in the characters if kind of they're shown with Scooby first. Mm. But, um, you know, that, you know, have... All, all that crap they did with the Hanna-Barbera characters. And, and I got to tell you, I've had friends really go after me thinking that I'm somehow uh, homophobic or, or, or angry with, with gay people. But making Snagglepuss gay because he was created to be a um, corny Shakespearean actor. If he's so theatrical... Isn't that kind of an insult to gay people? Oh, yes, you're all theatrical. Like a stereotype, you mean? I mean, and on top of that, the creator's idea, in my mind, unless it's Swamp Thing or something like that, where Alan Moore came in and added stuff to it, but it's kind of the creator that gets the say. I can tell you, if Bill and Joe were alive and you asked them, oh, is Snagglepuss gay? They'd look at you like you had a penis growing out of your forehead. Hmm. They, they, nobody thinks in those terms. They're cartoon characters. They're there to be funny and, and get hit in the face and fall off a cliff. I mean, they don't have sex lives. Right, they're, they're asexual. They don't even have genitals. They walk around with their pants, with no pants. So, I, you know, it's like, look, if you want to have a gay, funny animal character, that's great. Create one. Hmm. I mean, there's, there's Odd Duck or gay duck, I forget his name, but I love those cartoons. Hmm. But I have, it's not a gay issue, it's a creativity issue, and I think that if people want a character with a certain message, create a character made for that message. Hmm. But because uh, it's kind of like Warner Brothers a few years ago decided that Tweety Bird was a woman because they discovered through their marketing people that most women thought Tweety was a girl, and that's why they bought Tweety jewelry and things like that. So then they officially made Tweety a girl. Now that Warner Brothers is making new cartoons, Tweety's a boy again. Hmm. I I will say that I I I did like it. I I wasn't thrilled about Quick Draw McGraw being being a, a gay policeman and also a brutal one. But uh, but I could I could handle Snagglepuss. But um, it's it was trying to do something. That's he that's he likes it. What's that? Make sure you handle him where he likes it. Uh, all right, so um, <laughs> Alex, uh, you want to do the advertising career? I really so, love messing with you, academic guys. <laughs> <laughs> Grab it where he likes it, Jim. That's I'm going to repeat that line. I'm going to use that line again. Um, or two, <laughs> and I mean, we can't help it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, that's funny you mentioned funny animals without pants because Jim and I don't wear pants for these shows. That's a really interesting overlap. Yeah, but you're not funny animals. 
that's that's a really good point. <laughs> You're on fire. <laughs> So um, I'm kidding, by the way, audience. Uh, audience uh, we have pants, lo very long, sturdy pants are, are on right now. Extra pants on. We actually have two, two pairs pair of pants. Yeah, we're yeah. very pantsed up. Um, so uh, advertising. So from 1991 to 2000, you worked for 10 years um, at an ad agency, Ogilvy and Mather, doing commercials uh, for things like Post Fruity and Cocoa Pebble cereals. All sorts of things. It was actually very pro, uh, prolific uh, 10 years. So tell us how, because that's like you're kind of working on the, um, uh, like, the Ed, Ed, like Ed Grimley, John Candy stuff at the same time, Camp Candy, um, the Fantastic Four stuff, while you're also working at the ad agency doing stuff. So, so there's a lot of overlap time-wise. Tell us how you got into the ad agency. No, there wasn't an overlap there. I had already done that. Free, I mean, this was my new full-time job. I was actually working at Film Roman on a show called Crow, I think, when I took the job at Ogilvy. And that was about about the same time you mentioned. But all that other stuff happened in the 90s, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the thing with, uh, Hannah, with, with uh, the commercials was I was working on a lot of that stuff freelance since about 1983, but it wasn't me supervising anything. I was doing boards and models and that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Then I heard that the, the art director had quit, and uh, so I called him up and I said, well, how about hiring me? And they said, well, you haven't been trained in advertising. I said, I've, been, I've done you know, 50 of these commercials already. I know what you want. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out to him, I said, uh, I said, wouldn't you like to have an art director that actually communicates with the artist because it's all the same person? They said, yeah. He said, in that case, you won't mind paying me a separate fee for when I actually do the production work as a freelancer, and that way I don't have to mix the two jobs up because I don't have to. I don't have time. I'm busy selling stuff to the to the post to get get it made. Then I have to. Oh, okay. And, and that also applied to when I was doing the ads for comic books, the uh, art on the cereal boxes, and even the little things in the cereal boxes sometimes. So I had a, you can only imagine how happy I was to be working on my favorite characters and getting paid grand larceny money for doing it. That's awesome. And it was, and because, I, and that's the thing, I'm not bragging here, but it's in advertising you have no idea how much money they suddenly have when something needs to be changed mm. because everything is done at the last minute in advertising. Mm. The reason they, they love me so much that ad agency, I have a letter somewhere. I gave them a copy from Bill Hannity said, if Scott Shaw does it, it's approved. So with me in the, in the circle, they didn't have to worry about last minute approvals. Nice. So, so I mean, stuff going for me on that and uh when i started pebble cereal was way kind of toward the bottom of their middling accounts yeah when i left i was laid off because post was sold from uh craft to quaker oats mm. they weren't even sure what their camp and, and i don't think we've seen the commercials they don't even have an animation in them now. kids yeah. don't know what stones are except you know, the guys on the cereal box but uh you know, I um, I enjoyed it very much, and after a while, I worked from home so I could get a lot of other stuff done. Because I got to tell you, most and I'm not, I must sound like a jerk, and I don't mean to, but most of the people used to be advertising was like the smartest and best creators went to first because there was the most money and respect back in the fifties, right? Mm -hmm. Doing it now, I mean, when I was when I was there, most of the time I was spending fixing other people's storyboards because they'd come in and how do I draw this and how do I do that and it was like I'm not here to be the fixer <laughs> I mean it, it was kind of surprising that I was one of the only people there that could even draw among their art directors I see like, how can you be an art director and communicate with artists without being able to draw right yeah interesting so now that's that leads to an interesting question is 
what ha what happened to Saturday morning cartoons? Why are they gone? And why do a lot of these cereals don't have like the Honey Nut Cheerios B or the 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 Flintstones characters or animations or characters in the commercials for the cereals anymore? Like what happened? What happened to that? The party ended. What happened? Well, um, two things. Cereal got very expensive. So it's not being bought as much. And, uh, you know, people comment on the fact that eating that cereal, you know, will, will, will give you diabetes. I mean, I, I didn't even eat that cereal and I got diabetic just out of karma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, I would have sold Flintstone's nerve gas. I really wouldn't have cared as long as I was told, here's the budget, here's the schedule. Okay, those both sound good. And here's, here's the star, you know. Okay. Yeah, and here's Fred Flintstone. Even if it was Agent Orange, if it had Fred Flintstone, it's fine. It's wearing orange. So it all, you know, that would have been a, that, perfect. You know, I once worked on a bunch of Simpsons commercials for Japan because they were the color of the product. <laughs> I gotcha. That makes sense. Um, so then, yeah, so then, well, okay, so, so cereal became less glorified because of its high sugar content and bad health side effects. What, what's the second thing you were going to say? Well, just the fact that it became so expensive, you know, so a lot less people are buying it the way they okay. used it. So then what about as far as Saturday morning cartoons? Now, what I had read was an article that um, through a couple sequences, one thing that Bush Sr. did and then Clinton also did, that both of these legislations made it harder to fit X number of advertisements within one 30-minute cartoon. So then it was no longer the money was around to then make those Saturday morning cartoons because there was advertising limits that were set in the 90s. Is that what led to the death of the Saturday morning cartoon officially? Uh, no, I think it was Nickelodeon. Yeah. Okay, tell me, tell me about that. Well, Nickelodeon was, the, you know, I mean, it, it was the first uh, uh, cable station that I'm aware of that devoted themselves to children. And on top of that, they really knew how to brand themselves. They were kind of like, Jay Ward and Hanna-Barbera thrown into one because they were the only new studios when I was a kid. Therefore, they were like the cavalry. We would watch anything from either of those studios because not even because they were good, but because they were new. The same thing was the case with Nickelodeon. All these kids had seen, you know, not only a lot of cartoons, but by that time, cartoons were pretty mediocre. I mean, you know, the Smurfs were probably the liveliest thing on the air, and they were still teaching you a, a very important message. So, you know, it was the, the Nickelodeon stuff, they didn't have any of that. They were just funny and, and weird and uh, unique. And uh, kids could watch them um, any day of the week. I mean, I think initially they were on Saturdays maybe, but I know eventually, you know, Nickelodeon had cartoons on all the time. And mm. if it wasn't those shows, it would be other shows like Kablam and things like that. Okay. And, Network jumped in. I have a cartoon question related to that because um, uh, I've I've taught Flintstones before as, as in a uh, in a Saturday morning cartoon genre class, and one of the things that we talked about was that the the network when when the Flintstones transferred over to from prime time over to Saturday morning cartoons and and basically as that was starting to be created. Uh, progressively with each new spin on the Flintstones, they would kind of get less and less of the the dual uh, purpose where you had a, a where adults could enjoy it at one level and children would enjoy it at another level because you know you you talked about not the Flintstones but the original series had things like uh, infertility as as topics and, and adoption and things there were there were interesting one aspects was in one episode jim and all they said was oh let's make a wish that we could have a baby but there was a court battle uh, there was a dot there were there were court bat custody battles because i i pay attention to such things but, but that was not the only one there was there were weight issues with fred flintstone there were there were there were certainly things that that adults would would 
would follow on that. And the show did get Jim, not not after the second episode, second season of the Flintstones. I've been watching them. Oh after no, I I agree. The for, well, I'd say season three. You know, can but, I tell you please? the 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 extra episodes beyond uh, season second season was where Pebbles was introduced. They have about eight or nine episodes where Fred is trying to learn how to be a dad, and those are actually funny. And the animators are still kind of pushing it. But from that point on, and I didn't even notice this when I was a kid, but I certainly notice it now. Most of those scripts, with the exception of adding rock or stone to the ends of names, they took all their best animators and all their best writers and put them on the new shows. Because, oh, Flintstones are a success. We don't need to worry about anymore. And the writing, especially when they added Bam Bam, was completely for children on that show. Almost none of the stories were about domestic issues anymore. Almost the Flintstones always had enough money to go on vacation because it was a one way to have them meet, uh, you know, surfers or rock stars or whoever. And the whole thing changed because suddenly it wasn't about the honeymooners. We, we can debate season three just a little bit and we will at the next convention. I promise. Um, but you're right. It's primarily that episode is what I, I'm, I'm recalling. But my point is, what I've heard and what scholars have written about is that w what would happen was that the network wanted to exercise all adult material from all of these cartoons and gear them more and more toward young children because they wanted the ratings to not have adult listen uh, uh watchers that it was about focusing it solely on where the demographics were all about young children and that was for advertising and commercial purposes did you ever get a sense of that in in any of your workings this is the first time i've ever heard about it so because it's there's a lot of writings on it and a lot of people that acknowledged it that's that's well, interesting nobody's ever made a, made an issue of that with me and I've always tried to put as much adult stuff into them as possible, especially on Muppet Babies. We got away with an awful lot of stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm only talking about the Flintstones because as they went to Smoo and then other things, and, it, it, and then they began to regress, you know, to the Flintstone kids and that kind of thing. By that time, it was already in the toilet. Yes. Yeah, no, no. I mean, all the Saturday morning stuff was crap. You got to understand, that was all crap. It was really... I mean, what I'm suggesting is that was deliberate, that they wanted it to be crap because they didn't want adults to be able to stand to watch it. So that's why they hired me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not suggesting that about you. Jim, what are you saying about our guest? Uh. All right. I will. Uh, let's. Hey, why don't we talk about um, uh, oddball stuff? Oddball comics. So, oddball you know, comics. Now, now, you had mentioned, Scott, that. Um, You'd been you'd working on oddball comics and your comic history analysis for the past 40 years. There's a 10 year run where you were doing some online stuff on comic book resources. Recently, you have some articles in uh, in uh, Retro Fan Magazine for tomorrow's. Tell us about uh, tell us about oddball comics and your whole other career as a comic book historian, because not only can you draw, you can write, but you can also speak and analyze. So tell us tell us about it. Um, I. Uh... Even as a kid, I liked the weird comics. I bought, uh, you know, all the Marvels and all the DCs and all the, you know, all that sort of thing. But I, for example, I bought um, Conan, Monarch of Monster Isle was one of my favorites. I liked anything with dinosaurs or gorillas on the cover. It's really funny because, uh, what's his name? Um, Oh, the guy that ran DC for a while, uh, Erwin, Erwin Donenfeld, he believed the same thing. But I guess it worked because I was, I, I mean, I, that's what I saved my pennies for was uh, dinosaur comics. I remember collecting right off the racks every uh, issue of Kona, every issue of War of the Time Forgot. Mm. Um, I had one of my, my first comic subscription was Turok Son of Stone. Um, so I never liked I liked the popular stuff, but I always had stuff that was particular to what I liked. And it turned out that stuff was kind of the nutty stuff. And then I wound up 
working, uh, running a comic book store and working with these guys and seeing, and, and even going to comic conventions, even, even just comic con itself. I was seeing lots of comics that I wouldn't normally see. It was like when I worked for B Dalton bookseller as the, uh, shipping clerk, I'm unpacking boxes of books and finding out that I was interested in a lot more things than I realized. Yeah. Same thing when you're exposed to comics. And uh, first of all, the fact that I, that I never sneered at humor comics gave me an awful lot wider range of stuff that I was looking at. And, and then when I became a cartoonist, even a crummy cartoonist, I was real, I was really looking at the stuff and I was realizing, well, how come on this run of Lois Lane, every cover has something pointing to her crotch? Mm. Well, I found out years later that was when Joe Orlando was telling everybody sex sells. And, you know, it was after that uh, book about the uh, subliminal advertising. Mm. And he was oh, sure. that through. But, but instead of subliminal, he made it absolutely obvious. I mean... Lois is holding a spear at Superman's crotch and it's dripping something white. It's like, that's not Oh, she just took a sperm sample. Nice. So you before uh, Sharon Stone and Basic Instinct, there was actually Superman's girlfriend, Lois Lane, you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, they, I mean, but there's tons of stuff like that out there. But it's not just all dirty. It's essentially, you look at it and you go, how the hell did this get published? Because some cases, it's a bad choice of dialogue. For example, that famous one with, uh, it's Betty and me, and, and she's saying, oh, Archie, uh, yeah. thanks for rescuing me. And he says, yeah, I had to beat off three other guys to, to do it. <laughs> well, when you read it, it doesn't, but when you say it the way you're saying it. Well, how else do you say it? I didn't say, I mean, it's written exactly like that. And the terms, yeah, you're right. The term beat off is in bright red letters. I can't stop laughing every time you say that phrase. I don't know what it is. It's like a button. Oh, oh, well, you know, don't say that. <laughs> Get the women in on this. Um, uh, I think that uh, it came out, that comment came out in 65, which meant I was 14. And I said, and somebody at a show once said, please, that probably just wasn't even a term for that back then. I, I said, I, I have firsthand information. It <laughs> Oh, that's cool. So it actually was the term back then. That's oh, it, yeah. There's also Jughead's Eat Out. That's another comic. <laughs> I can't stop laughing when you say these things. Well, but, but, and, and, and then there's that famous Rifleman cover where he's holding that log up at a very suspicious angle, and his, his TV kid looks like he wants to get the hell out of there as much as possible. And meanwhile, Chuck Connors is like, hey, check this out. It's yeah. Like, and I actually asked um can't think of the actor's name that played his son, but he, he said, I don't remember a thing about that. And I would think he would because um, a lot of those uh, photo covers for uh, Dell and uh, Gold Key Comics, they actually just had the actors in town and they'd like take the three stooges. They'd say, okay, let's go down to Western costumes, see what you want to put on. Right. They'd you know, Westerners or, or, dressed like genies or whatever, they'd go back for a couple days and shoot the next three weeks worth of covers because they didn't want to have to use those crappy little black and white stills that they always use for publicity on stuff like that. That's not going to sell a comic. Although you remember a lot of comics that did like have a call for cover, but then you look, you try to find the hero and he's like this black and white guy kind of like in a little cameo stuck in some place because they're like, well, I guess we have to use this. So, so, Scott, you, you'd you mentioned um, a few uh, people like uh, with Little Archie, like with Bowling and with John Stanley and stuff. Um, one that I wanted to ask you about, and it certainly fits with the Oddball uh, comics, is uh, Odgen Whitney and Herbie. Um, Odgen Whitney's the perfect guy to draw Herbie because it's like his drawing style is like of a... It's not a comic book style. It's like a guy that illustrates brochures on, you know, how to, how to uh, you know, give yourself, you know, some medical operation or something. I mean, <laughs> it's so institutional. He tries to draw funny. It's not funny. But when he just draws like himself, it's really funny. It's really funny. 
yeah. were you reading that at the time or is that something you I that the time. Time. And, and i oh you know they they got um kurt schaffenberger to start doing covers toward the end and those weren't nearly as good because they were too well drawn the only guy i always thought should have could have taken over herbie that had that same institutional look would have been john forte Oh, and you mentioned you, you mentioned um, Chick Stone earlier, and Chick Stone was working for those guys, not for that, but for for Nemesis as oh, well. Yeah, I wrote the introduction to the collection of Nemesis, and I think the collection cost more than if you went out and bought the comics themselves. Hmm. Nobody wants those. Nobody. <laughs> I I love those comics. I love I love the costume. I love everything about that comic. And you liked it because he stole the Phantom's shorts. <laughs> They both wore striped shorts, and stripes don't appear anywhere else in their, their, their costume. I'm surprised DC didn't have somebody wearing go-go checks for pants. Remember when they put those go-go checks across the top of each cover? Like oh, the yeah. Yeah, it, it seems like it would have cop popped up in, uh, in um, Dial H for Hero at least once. Well, it, it always killed me because it's like you're using valuable space for a, needle, a thing that doesn't say comics at all but they seem to think it worked for a couple of years. Now it, it said professional car racing much more than it did uh, uh, yeah. comics. Exactly. Those guys don't read comics. <laughs> Maybe Alex Toth's hot rods, a hot rod? I don't know. Probably well, not. Alex Toth used to work for cartoons and those automotive humor magazines. Yeah. A lot of guys did. Russ Manning did. Did, did, did Ditko do anything for those? I know he did some uh, stuff. He just cracked mainly. Huh? He mainly worked for Cracked. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he he loved Charlton. Boy, I you know, I was going through uh, scanning some books last night, and it's amazing how loyal he was to Charlton, considering I guess they just buy take anything he drew. Yeah. And yeah. not ask him about it. You know, not not interfere with it, which of course would be what he would care about. Yeah, I think he was just like exercising his comic art form every time, experimenting things. Yeah, yeah. Although I I really do love some of his humor stuff. He did some of those gorgos and congas that he tries to tries to draw him funny, and he's really good at it. Right. He he's he's a, he's actually has a very good sense of humor in in some of that stuff. His he does a lot of one page cartoons. That are that are would surprise people because they they take him so seriously. But I have um, a that hired him to do comics and storyboards for uh, Tiny Toons. What? I'm not making this up. Tiny Toons, the the uh, yeah, yeah. Ditko did some work on that show. Really? I I've never heard that before. That's <laughs> tell us about the well. That's <laughs> news. You'd hear lots of things. <laughs> uh, seriously. I'm not making this up. It's a guy that uh, that I know that likes to kind of hire people that he doesn't know will be able to do the job. And then if they don't, then he just does it himself. And sometimes it turns out horribly, but Ditko's uh, comics were for overseas with all those characters like Plucky Duck and... Yeah. Remember the bugs jr's name but you know and he drew all of them pretty well but they all had that ditko vibe to them which i didn't think worked very well because they all immediately look kind of psycho you know i mean <laughs> not that he was but 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 no, I mean, we know i've seen the big boy i've seen uh the big boy comics there's there's something uh off about it i'll tell you something that's going to horrify everyone that manages to get this far into this thing. When I was a kid, I was buying Gorgo and Conga. I knew Steve Ditko's name because he signed those things. When the first issue of Spider-Man came out, I never saw Adult Fantasy 15, but I got a, a neighbor gave me a copy of that Spider-Man because he didn't like it, the first one. I read through it, and I thought, this comic is so cheap, and somebody must have printed this in their, in their basement. I cut it up with an X-Acto knife. I have never done anything with a comic remotely to cut it up or disface it or anything. And it was like one of those Saturday or Sunday afternoons where you're 
13 and you can't get anybody to drive anywhere. And wow. I just, there and just traced every frame with a, cut it out and then I cut out each. <laughs> oh, no. That sounds like something from Jeffrey Dahmer's house. Well, I could have gotten a job in Marvel's uh, production department. I was so good with cutting it apart for the next Yeah. <laughs> But no, that that was uh, that was hard. <laughs> to that's real. like um, that's like something that like what Ed Gein was used to do, uh, you know, in his cabin. But you did that with the Ditko comic. Yeah, no blood, no blood. <laughs> and you didn't make a necklace out of the panels. No, I just tossed them in the trash. I mean, I think the thing that offended me most was I hadn't had the comic for more than five minutes, and the cover ink was coming off in my hands. Oh, okay, because that was early where they weren't coating the paper stock so there was nothing to prevent the ink from coming off in your <laughs> so scott two two uh questions to sort of begin to wrap up or wrap up uh one where's the exclamation point come from and how long have you had it and secondly uh what current or new projects have you got uh the uh our fans ought to uh, know about well i um let's see what was the first one? <laughs> exclamation, the exclamation point. point in your name. It's no big deal. I was, um, like I said, I was born in 51. So by the time I was in junior high school, there were a lot, it seemed like there were a lot of movies. Atari was one of them. Dinosaurus was one of them a few years earlier. A lot of movies with one word and an exclamation point. But then I was really into the, the, not car culture, but just the Big Daddy Roth style monster car culture. And a second guy started doing it, who I never realized actually started doing it before Roth, named Stanley Miller from Detroit, who called himself Mouse with an exclamation point. And those ads started appearing when he started, they started doing uh, model kits of his stuff. And that's who I stole it from. Because I thought, it's not just that this guy is doing it, but that's how every sentence in comics ends, unless it has, an, it has a, uh, a question mark. I wasn't talking about Classics Illustrated that had good English. But um, I thought, too, this just, this just shows how excited I am about drawing cartoons. Mm. I started doing that probably in seventh grade. Mm. So oh, nothing cool. to do with riflemen. It's not a penis. There's No, no, but I could make it one. <laughs> If, if we if we do the uh, if we do a part two, we'll 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 have that. I can, that you know, I could start drawing it that way if I get more people going. Yeah, well, you're gonna have to make it kind of veiny then. Well, I I've got a lot of S. Clay Wilson comics, so I learned. How to do that. There you go. Well, that's <laughs> and true. and what else? What are you working on currently? I just love dragging you guys down into my cesspool. This is wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm going to feel bad when my son insists upon listening to this. Well, you're glad I wasn't my real self. Uh, um, things I've been working on, let's see. Well, I, I'm finishing a sequel to a book I illustrated a few years ago. I didn't write it. I'm kind of involved with the writing on this one, but it's called Maroon Lagoon 2. Um, let me show you a picture from it. Oh, everything fell down. But here, here's a. Oh, wow. it's beautiful. That is beautiful. And Look at that cat. These are these are two two page spreads that I did. It all takes place in this in the Everglades swamp, and a uh, a, 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 a hurricane comes through and gets all the kids separated from their parents, and and everything's mixed up, so they don't know what anything is. So they're trying to make stuff out of the debris. I mean, it's it's very visual. Um, I've also got a number of graphic novels that I'm uh, developed that I'm trying to get a uh, publisher to take up. But right now, I don't think anybody's making any decision. Um, other than that, I'm uh, working on my Oddball Comics book, which will be out who knows when, but it'll be out. It's uh, from tomorrow's. And um, I'm doing commissions once in a while. Nice. You know, I'm... I, I, I haven't been approached by any studios or any comic book companies for a while. And uh, quite honestly, I'm kind of more interested in creating my own stuff right now anyway than doing other people's stuff. Right. I know that's what people say when they run out of 
people trying to hire him, but that I've kind of drawn all the characters that I wanted to draw of other people's. Now I want to draw more of mine. I, I wanted I wanted to tell you that when I told my son, and this is what, what you did for him, which we, we framed, and he looks at it all the time. He he used it for show and tell on Zoom recently and oh, told the story. Oh, you had that behind you this whole time. I was looking on the wall to see how you had two of them. Yeah, no, no, there it is. Okay, well, that's off model. I should go correct that. I <laughs> and and when I told him that I was going to be interviewing you today, he said, what do you mean? He's my friend. He's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll always remember Willoughby because I like Twilight Zone. Well, that's that's why we named him that. Really? That's yep. cool. Well, Sun, sunshine and sunlight and serenity. That was the lines that made me think I, I that's a good name for Willoughby. Well, I, uh, that's very good. That's very nice. Thanks. <laughs> I, Alex? I, I know you're trying to shut up. I, I had a good Rod Serling story for you, but we'll do that next. Oh, no. We, yeah, go for it. To, let, absolutely. Well, I met Rod Serling when he was uh, lecturing at colleges. I also met Al Cap the same way. Oh, wow. And, I had the same reaction to my question. I asked Al Cap, what's it like working with Frank Zappa? Frank Frazetta. Frank Zappa, that would have been good. <laughs> I asked, uh, um, Serling was actually supposed to be promoting Planet of the Apes and, Ga and Night Gallery. He actually was apologizing for both of them because he felt that Night Gallery was awful, which I think is true. But he was even apologizing for Planet of the Apes because they changed the script significantly. And I, my question was, completely out of left field, were you ever influenced when uh, coming up with your stories for the Twilight Zone by EC Comics? Yeah. And Cap said, what the hell does a hippie know about Frank Frazetta? And uh, Serling said the same thing. What the hell does a hippie know about EC Comics? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cartoonist and a comic collector and, you know, they're pretty adult and they're pretty much, you know, I said they're all based on kind of O. Henry type stories. So I figured maybe, you, you know, you have science fiction writers writing this. They probably read those comics because they had Bradbury stories. Of Go, course. That I want you to come down and see me in my dressing room after I'm done. So I came down and I walk in and he goes, of course they were EC comics. We oh. were... Absolutely inspired by them. Most people don't know that. I said, well, I just kind of figured that sci-fi guys are going to know that stuff. He goes, of course we did. And we talked for about 10 minutes, and he was absolutely oh, that's great. great and receptive and very short. Very short. And, wow. So you, you know, got the confirmation. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think guys still back then were surprised that people were knowledgeable about that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, so, and what did Al Cap say when you went to his dressing room after? No, he didn't do. He didn't invite. <laughs> in fact, the only reason I got to ask him that was he came out to UC San Diego and was speaking about trying to raise more controversy because he was the guy that stood up against hippies. And so he was getting all these people showing up and he was getting in the news a lot. And that's what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. So he got to this thing and he started out and he said, uh, he was actually very funny and chipper. And he said, uh, he was kind of jousting with the kids, you know, rather than acting insulted. And then all of a sudden he said, says, okay, one more interruption and I'm leaving. Like out of the blue. I mean, he seemed to be enjoying it. So everybody shut up and one guy, did that slow clap and he turned around. It was in an audit in the uh, gymnasium and he turned around and walked across the courts and walked into a little door and slammed the door shut. And everybody said, okay, screw him. And they all got up and left except, huh. except for me and my fanboy buddies who are all sitting in the front row and we're looking at each other like, what the hell? <laughs> and we kind of sat there for about 10 minutes, kind of, well, maybe you can, no, he's not going to come out. But what, what did he do that for? We don't know. Aren't we here walking a very kind of odd gait because of his, and I now know what it's like to have an odd gait with yeah. a prosthetic foot. And um, it's Al Cap. 
And apparently somebody, he never told us this, but as an adult, I think somebody must have said, you're not getting paid your honorarium unless you go out there and give a speech. And it was to 10 of us. And we were all comic nuts. And, and, and quite honestly, I knew he hated hippies, but I didn't care. I didn't know he was a, you know, a guy that preyed on women. I don't think I would have liked him as much. But I didn't care that he hated hippies. I couldn't expect him to be hated, but mm -hmm. I loved him. And I still love Little Abner. You can't say that too loud. Oops. But, I mean, it's one of the most brilliant, most dour, cruel comics about how cruel mankind is of anything I've ever read. Mm -hmm. It's also how I found out I like girls. You know, it's like, wow. Because so, of Daisy May? No, actually, all the women. I mean, even Mammy had Popeye's head, but... <laughs> But a woman's body. But had a nice body, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I was reading some of that old, because uh, Dennis Kitchen reprinted some of those. And uh, it was interesting. Like, one continuity was, like, the plot to the Waterboy movie. And then another continuity was the plot to Billy Madison. And I was like, whoa, dude, this is, like, there's a lot of comic com comedy gold. Just, like, and there's, like, hundreds to thousands of these stories. In, if it's not in, gold, how come it's winding up in Adam Sandler movies? <laughs> but it is. And that I just thought that's like crazy. I'm like, oh my God, that's like another there's like three Adam Sandler movies I've read already in just the first year and a half. Well, you know, he was I'll never forget as a kid, I was just shocked because I was kind of used to comics being funny and his stuff was kind of funny. But I remember a little Abner or somebody fell down a bottomless pit. And they're all like, wow, wow. And then they all just walk away. What's for what's for dinner? And I oh poke chops, you know. And I'm thinking, aren't they even going to try to help him? <laughs> how, how, how people were. I mean, he didn't know how women were, but he knew he knew the cruelty of mankind. And yeah. that that's what I dig about it. Is he 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 sold it in the weirdest way possible? But boy, you read that, and it's obvious how he does not respect the human race, and probably for good reason. Yeah, and then also what he did with uh, Chester Gould and uh, Dick Tracy with the Fearless Fosdick character, it's like he really was able to make fun of Chester Gould and then reduce the value of Dick Tracy as a strip based on his ridicule. Like he was able to, he had a lot of power in that. It, it was kind of evil, but fascinating. Do you think, do you think that hurt, hurt Tracy? Yeah, I think so. Boy, I... I Look, Dick Tracy was never out selling wild cream, wild root cream oil hair. hair. You know, I, I think of him as radically different. I love Dick. Dick Tracy's one of my favorite strips, too. Yeah, for sure. Me, too. Oh, surreal. And I actually, I like the classic stuff, but I like the stuff that's like the oddball comic stuff, too. Like the, like the 50s Dick Tracy then, or what? Where it was like he was trying to be contemporary, but it just looked like he was losing his mind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the pouch is my all-time weird. That should be an underground comic. <laughs> you know, no, I won't go into it. But no. <laughs> yeah, I love the Tracy stuff. I I love the '30s stuff and the blank and all that. And uh, but then and it changes. Uh, and I could actually keep reading Chester Gould. Too. I could just read that for a couple years and I'd be fine. By the way, if there's anybody out there that wants to sell. About the first half of those IDW books, I just finally bought a set, and half of them got lost in the mail. Oh no! Yes, I am absolutely despondent. Except I finally now have all the ones that I haven't read reread. Right. At least then you can yeah do that. Every Dick, Tra Dick Tracy reissue, and and I I bought those mainly because I thought now I can get rid of all the all those black foreign ones and all the other stuff. I mean, it's take. Now I'm at the part where I got to try to make room. You know, yeah. So. But yeah, the early stuff's pretty interesting because you have uh, like uh, references to the Lindbergh baby in one oh. continuity. Um, you have like a J. Edgar Hoover type guy um, in a couple of them. Oh, it's, it's straighter and based on reality, you know? Yeah, for sure it is. Um, I once uh, asked Ken Wilson, I said, uh, I said, I love your stuff, but I can't figure out who did, who was your inspiration? He goes, oh, Chester Gould. Yeah. Makes oh, of course. It makes sense when you say it. 
Yeah. I said, oh, you only were looking at the villains, huh? He goes, not really. <laughs> and I just love how horrible things happen to the bad guys. Like, there's one really horrible person, and then, like, a bear eats them in the forest. Like... Oh. My favorite, I forget who it is, but they're trapped under something that is blocked by a cake of ice. And yeah. there's a big nail through this beam. And it's like here. Not going in with eye, but it's like here. And he must have spent six weeks having this ice cube melt. And it's like, nobody could get away with that now. I mean, just the material. I mean, it is so intentionally creepy. It is, yeah. That's why I love it. Yep. You ever heard the, heard the story about uh, R. Crumb and Jay Lynch going to visit him? No. No. Because uh, they were both hippies, but they like, you know, I mean, whether, whether you're a hippie or not, if you like comics, they're going to be talking to the most serious right-wing guy. If you like his comics, suddenly you're his pal, right? Yeah. But he didn't see them as his pals. Oh. And he said, uh, and, and Jay, I think it was Jay asked him, he says, so um, something about in your comics, because everybody is drawn kind of grotesquely, how do we know which ones are the good guys and bad guys? And he said that Gould really shot him a look like he wanted him to die. And he said, if you don't know the difference between the good guys and the bad guys, you're one of the bad guys. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and you know, he had this fake uh, graveyard behind his house. They were worried they were going to wind up there. He made little, he made little uh, cardboard uh, tombs and had all, had their, all the bad guys' names on it that he killed them. <laughs> So he wasn't exactly king of sanity either. You know? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, he had a fury going on in there. That's interesting. Yeah. That's good insight. But, you know, nobody draws like him. I mean, it, in the interior of a car, the seats are like 20 feet wide. You know, I mean, I just love the way his stuff looks. Yo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it, love when the, I love when the blank is um, killing people. And it's a different way every time that he kills another criminal. Like he stuck, ties a guy into a car, closes the garage and let the carbon monoxide kill him, right? Throws another guy out of an airplane, crashes into a farm. It's like, and then another guy, he shows out, shoves out a moving car. He's rolling, his neck breaks on the pole. <laughs> it's like, what? He spent an awful lot, too much time thinking about how to kill people. And I think it affected his judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that one again. <laughs> oh yeah, better come up with something new. Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, um, well, we could we could easily chat all day, and I and I had a great time. And and uh, um, but um, I'm gonna do a little closeout conclusion, um, if that's all right with you guys. Sure, absolutely. But thank thank you, Jim, and and and, and thank you both. And uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for letting me run my mouth. Oh, we had a blast. Yeah, this, it was fun. This was this was great. So, um, all right. Well, uh, and, and, uh, you're, you're multi-talented. Uh, you had, yeah, this it's a, uh, it's, it's interesting because you, you've worked in various media, but it all comes with that same cartoon creative spirit. And I see why you have so many different awards in all sorts of variety of things. Cause it just comes down to wanting to do something new and different each time. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thrilled that I grew up on a lot of the stuff that you made, the cartoons, the commercials. They were huge influences on me. So thanks so much for being here today. And, oh. and I like you much more than any of Willoughby's other friends, I got to say. Okay. Well, I'm sure they all drive you crazy. but <laughs> give Well, I can talk comics with you. None of them read comics, unfortunately. Okay. And, they call, and they call Jim Grandpa. It's not really fair. <laughs> that is not remotely funny. <laughs> well, I, I had my son when he was young too and it was weird going to PTA meetings and all their parents were like kids to me it was strange anyway thank you both um, I hope we see each other at Comic Fest next year if you can come out I, I, that may be the first show I might be willing to go to if things have calmed down by then. right right I'm so well, glad uh, we went last year because it was it was a way to say goodbye to so many, you know, not we didn't know we weren't going to see people or friends for a long time. But you, know, you leave that show with a smile on your face every time. Yeah, that's what happened. 
It's well, never- um, well, um, uh, this has been another episode of the Comic Book Historians podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Thanks again, uh, Scott Shaw, for your creative contributions to Americana, as well as being a guest on our show. Thank you very much. Thank you.